stuff out of my bag. So he's just going to film that. Uh, roll roll call. Big bag. Yep. Okay. We're ready? All right. You might want. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the uh, first meeting of 2019, January 7th. And um, we are going to uh, open the meeting with roll call, and then we're going to go into executive session. So, Judy, if you could do the roll, please. Yes, Housh. I'm here. McQueen. Here. Stokes. Here. Krieger. Also here. Stanford. Here. Also present, Village Manager Patty Bates. Okay. Um, so I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of, Judy, why don't you just uh, give us the three things? The purpose of the discussion of the potential discipline of a public employee, the evaluation of, a pub of public employees, and the potential sale of public property. Okay. I move that we go into executive session for the three issues just named. I second. Okay. Sanford. All and right. Uh, Housh. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Sanford. Yes. All right. You are right. in. Great. So, Patty. Uh, All right. All right. We've got lots of props today. <laughs> All right, John, we're good? Uh, okay. So, uh, welcome to our first meeting of 2019, uh, the January 7th meeting. And we have already called this meeting to order just coming out of executive session. So, uh, we're going to go right into announcements. And uh, do we have any announcements? We have. Oh. Yes, I was hoping oh. that somebody would uh, highlight yeah. our Martin Luther King Jr. Day events. Yes, it's mm -hmm. called Stay Woke. It's a movement, not a moment. Martin Luther King Cor Commemoration Programming. So it's on Thursday, January 17th through Tuesday, January 27th with workshops, teaching, and various events. Should I? Mention anything else? Sure. I mean, or if, if there's anything else to mention, or Lisa, well, did yeah. you have some details? Yeah, I brought I brought this to council. Oh, cool. Um, I think particularly um, the event on Monday, uh, the usual uh, Martin Luther King March, and then there's going to be a program at 11 o'clock at the John Bryan Center gym that includes the World House Choir. Um, that's fantastic. In case you don't know. <laughs> But I'm not biased. Um, and I think a highlight for me of that Martin Luther King event is always the Yellow Springs uh, student essays mm -hmm. and the awarding of the Community Peacemaker Award. It's just really always a very positive event. And fortunately, it doesn't seem like it'll be like 30 below like it was last year mm -hmm. when everyone froze trying to get there. So try to join that. There's child care um, available for the event if kids uh, don't want to be in to the session. Excellent. And yeah, I just want to reiterate, this is always my favorite day of the year in Yellow Springs. And uh, uh, happy that the village is able to support um, this really important uh, cultural event for our community. Um, and that will also mean that our council meeting will be on the 22nd, since the 21st is a holiday. Um, I had a few things I wanted to mention. Uh, and. If you notice the candy canes on the table, those came from my tree because I was thinking about how uh, Christmas tree pickup that's sponsored by the village and the Boy Scouts uh, or the Scouts um, is January 14th and 15th. Make sure to put your live tree close to the road. And uh, yes, if it's your artificial tree, you can put that in the closet. Um, and uh, yeah, and enjoy candy cane because uh, uh, I thought I would get started. I also want to say I love that we wait till the middle of January because Columbus, I, I get these notifications from them and they do it like right after the new year. And I'm just like, it's too soon. Um, okay. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is we have new bike lights. Yes. All right. We got these from uh, the Department of Transportation, Department of uh, Health. Uh, they come in a nice little case and everything, and uh, these were freebies, um, part of the You Move movement with the active transportation team. That was the reason that we have an active transportation plan, by the way. Um, that's where that grant came from. So you can always get lights at the PD. Judy Kittner is our uh, bike light guru, um, and uh, 
you can always contact a council member as well. And uh, if a friendly officer stops you uh, because you don't have a bike light, uh, that's because we want to make sure that we're promoting safety in the village. Okay, I think that's all my announcements. Anything else? No? All right, good. Um, so, uh, I guess we don't have anything on the consent agenda. So uh, now we're going to review the agenda. So um, anything we need to add, change? I have a question. Should we be voting on president and vice president of council? We just do that when it's a new configuration of council. Oh. So it's every two years. Oh, OK. Yep. And that means we also don't need to update our policies and procedures for our meetings. Um, we do that every two years as well. Oh, good to know. Yes. So you are still vice president, and I'm All still right. president. Okay. Good now. All right. Uh, anything else about agenda? the agenda? Yes. I have a couple of people to nominate for commissions. Okay. Great. Oh, you do the too. same ones? No, different, different ones. Members. Okay. Yes, okay. we have so commission nominations. two people for a planning commission. Okay. Great. So that will be on new business. Anything else? Okay. Um, Marianne, petitions and communications? Yes. We had several uh, letters. One was from Gary Greenberg, who would like the village to revisit our fluoridation uh, process. And if council would, were to decide that, I would recommend that the Environmental Commission weigh in on that. And, and I, in fact, I could bring it up at the Environmental Commission as a see where. I mean, I'm, I'm open to exploring it. I know when it's come up before, we've decided not to go that route. Right. But um, if you guys have capacity for it, that sounds great. We'll see. OK, uh, got a letter from Lori Asklin in support of the senior housing planned unit development. A letter from Mitzi Miller with concerns and suggestions in regard to the senior housing PUD. Uh, we got a letter from Green County Public Library saying best wishes and thanks. And Marsha Walgren submitted some information about the Vernay cleanup uh, <coughs> concerns regarding public health in that regard. Excellent. Thanks, Marianne. Um, all right, so I think we're ready to move into our legislation. And um, first up, we have Ordinance 2019-01. Uh, Judy, if you could read that in by title only. All right, this is authorizing the annual transfer of funds and declaring an emergency. Okay. Uh, can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. All right. I thought I said, yeah, there's Colleen, yes. I tried to get her to go home, but she was still working, so she <laughs> came on in. Aw. <laughs> it's always good to see your smiling face. Thank you. If there was any questions on the ordinance, it's to um, have legislation to approve the transfer of the money that we have in the funds, the general fund, the, and the um, operating funds for the electric water and um, sewer over into the capital projects and the other operating funds. And it's an annual. And these were all um, transfers that were included in the in budget the council approved. I think it's good to just highlight the reason why we have some of these um, somewhat large transfers, which was this whole goal to right size our budget lines and think about you know how we can, um, I guess, keep enough in reserve uh, so that we, you know, don't have any issues, but at the same time making sure that we're investing current taxpayer dollars in current infrastructure and other projects and services. So uh, I really appreciate that we, you know, have made those changes. All right. Okay. Questions or comments? Uh, okay. So uh, thank you, Colleen. I'll open the public hearing since this is uh, an emergency ordinance. Uh, do we have any questions or comments from citizens? Okay, if not, I'm going to close the public hearing. And uh, Judy, if you could call the roll. And if you would like it read a second time, Colleen's fine with that. She can do two reads as an emergency. We just need it to go into effect after that second reading. We didn't want to do the 30-day wait. Right. Um, so your pleasure, whether you want one reading or um, two. I feel like with all the time we spent on the budget, we do not need a second reading because okay. this is just reflecting what we've already done. So yep. I think this reading's good. All right, McQueen. <laughs> Yes. Krieger. Yes. Sanford. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Housh. Yes. 
All right. Next up, we have uh, the first reading, thanks, Colleen, of Ordinance 2019-02. And uh, Judy, I think we can do that one by title only as well. All right. <laughs> this is amending the official zoning map of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, for the property located between East Marshall Street and East Herman Street, identified by the following Green County parcel ID numbers, and they are quite extensive, and they are mm -hmm. right here if you'd like to take a look at them. Um, this is to zone those parcels which are on contained on 1.853 acres from RB Moderate Density Residential District to PUD Planned Unit Development. And, uh, and then just to clarify, we are talking about the site for the affordable senior housing development so that everybody understands that this is a time to speak about that. Uh, so can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. Okay. Uh, who is I, Patty? I am. Um, so this is simply the next step in the process um, at the previous council meetings. Uh, council had approved moving ahead with the PUD and in order for Home Inc. to be able to apply for their grant, we have to rezone that property. So this will be read twice um, and then go into effect 30 days after uh, assuming passage on the second read. It will go into effect 30 days after that uh, to rezone the property in time for Home Inc. to be able to apply for their grant. Okay, great. Um, questions or comments from Council? Uh, I mean, I have a few things I want to say, but uh, first of all, uh, I'll open the public hearing, and if there are any questions or comments from citizens. Wow. Um, okay, uh, what I wanted to highlight is I, uh, Mitzi Miller's letter resonated with me, and um, not just because she used my name so many times, but um, <laughs> but that there, were, it, there were a couple things that I thought uh, that we should highlight out of that. Okay, first of all is, um, I mean, I don't think I need Emily to explain what I understood from last time, which is that um, uh, you know, in terms of this question about do uh, Yellow Springers get priority, right? That's not how the system works, right? Uh, there's a waiting list. We were told that um, our community is going to be well informed and, and interested and that typically what happens is that a lot of those people that are already in the community or have been here before will likely be in those units, right? But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the process is that once that, you know, uh, waiting period starts, it is noticed to the public in general, right? So am I correct? <laughs> Or, or do you want to refine what I'm explaining? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm Emily Seibel um, with Yellow Springs Home Inc. And yeah, so my understanding is that as soon as we receive, receive approval for the project, there will be an interest list that opens, and that will remain open until about 120 days before we start taking applications. And then at that time, everyone on the interest list will be notified um, that the applications are opening. And so there really isn't going to be any sort of public outreach until the applications are actually open. Okay. But and then it would be first come, first serve. Right. First come, first serve. And so there, you know, there is not a way with this project to, um, you know, give a higher score just because you are a villager, a resident of Yellow Springs. But I think it's very important what we did learn is how these things typically play out. And so I think it's important not to think about worst case scenario, and that is gonna to relate to a couple other comments I wanted to make. Um, but I think one thing I would encourage is <coughs> I liked Mitzi talking about like the, the educational component and being really transparent about how all this works. And so whatever we can set up in that regard um, that Home Inc. can help with and the village can support is great because we are invested in this project. Um, the second thing that came up was the issue around parking. Um, and based on everything I heard, I was pretty comfortable with the idea of start with 42 and we can wait and see about adding more. Everybody seemed to be on board with that. We're trying to balance this green space thing. I also have this vision with the, uh, uh, the golf cart parking 
that it could be something that allows for, um, uh, you know, like kind of bricks with grass in between, you know, so a surface that's more porous, that wouldn't be that expensive. So I imagine that, you know, once we get there, because I'm positive we're going to get there, that, um, you know, we have some flexibility around that. But I want to be, you know, cognizant of the parking issue. And so one thing that Mitzi brought up, uh, which I thought was a good point, is if outreach to uh, Friends Care and the uh, fire department has not been specifically done, I'd like to just know what the openness is around sharing parking in that area. I also imagine that those roads are wide enough that we could potentially create on-street parking. So again, I don't want to think about worst case scenario, but I want us to be cognizant. And so if we can be proactive about that, and again, if you can help take the lead, that would be great. Call me. Um, and then the last thing I want to say related to this worst case scenario thing is, I know there was this idea of a you know, stoplight cost, costing $225,000 being brought up. I really don't think that is the kind of thing that's going to be needed. Uh, and partly it's based on something that Kevin said about how this was, there was a facility there that had in and out traffic before, right? We haven't had that for a while, but I just don't see that area of town being this, you know, that it's going to get all crazy and hectic. I could be wrong. We're doing traffic studies, right? So we are dealing with that. Um, but I just, I don't think that kind of significant investment is going to end up being necessary. So I want us to just kind of remember that, you know, there may be some things that come up, but overall, uh, you know, this is not an unusual use for that space given what was there before. And, uh, but we will be proactive. We'll think about those issues and address them as they come. And uh, if we really do need to do something like put in a stoplight, we'll get a grant for that. We'll figure out a way so it, like, we don't have to spend taxpayer dollars on it. We'll handle that. So those are my comments. Uh, any other? Yeah, Lisa. Do we know if the township did any safety traffic analysis when they cited that for the fire station? I do not know for sure, but the traffic for the fire station would probably require, if anything, an emergency vehicle light as opposed yeah, to a stoplight. I mean, I think that's the, so, you know, thinking of um, Mr. Johnny Burns' comments about that being a dangerous intersection, mm -hmm. you know, and I live right around the corner, and I've been thinking a lot about, you know, the emergency mm -hmm. vehicles pulling mm -hmm. out and actually find that to be more concerning mm -hmm. than the residential. I can, I can ask. Right? Yeah. And I also mm -hmm. have one other very small well, and I do, but I do just want to say to that point, we don't exactly, I mean, that was, I think, more of a feeling that it was a dangerous area. Uh -huh. I mean, we don't, we haven't seen any evidence of that. And so I just want us to not, like, conclude that. But I agree, we, we need to It's a slow it. place to sit and wait for a safe spot time to go, yep. as a person who lives right there. Okay. So I, I hope that you won't judge me for asking this question, but when the new building is built, can people have pets? That, that is a very good question that I don't have the answer to, so I can find out and get back with you on the 22nd. For those of us who may believe that life is not worth living unless you can have pets. No, I know. No. <laughs> we talk about <laughs> this a lot at Home Inc. And it, it was priority number one to have a pro-pet policy for the rentals we're developing. But I'm just not familiar with pet policies and tax credits. So I can find Thanks. out. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Forgive me. Mm -hmm. I've been worrying about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Lisa. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I, I would just like Fair. to respond to the concern about people from outside coming in and choosing to live in the senior housing apartment. Um, contrary to some people's opinion, maybe, not everyone wants to live here. Um, truly, not everyone wants to live here. The people who want to live here want to live here because they like Yellow Springs. And frequently, that's because they worked here. They have children here. They have parents here. Or maybe they did live here and had to move away. Uh, so clearly, in this particular case, the people that are going to most know about it and 
if they want to live there, are going to get their application in as soon as possible. But it doesn't mean that the other people who might be coming in are, well, I don't know what I would say, but they're people who have some connection to Yellow Springs. Those are the people that want to live in Yellow Springs. So I don't think we need to be afraid of that. Thank you. All right. Can I say uh, yeah, sure, please. people. My name's Mitzi Miller. Um, I don't think people are afraid of other people coming in. I think the educational component of this has not been fairly shared with our seniors. And, and as an advocate for seniors, that's what I'm asking, that that part be shared because I'm hearing from seniors which have, has scared me to death oh I'm, I'm this housing is for us it's for seniors and there's certain qualifiers that you must have in order to live there um, if it's you know a, a certain person I'm asking I guess to get clarity on the funding source, the understanding of that part of this, and for seniors, and how that fair housing component, I hope um, Home Inc. will discuss that and share that tonight, works in this whole process. So people understand it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that they understand that there's going to have to be outreach, there's going to have to be advertisement. How far range is that going to be? And, and to educate our citizens who think this housing's for them. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. And, and, and again, I want to say, like, I think that's a great request. And, and I believe that, you know, that, that we're going to make that happen. So I, I think that's, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, okay. Anything else? Um, okay, so uh, this is the first of two readings. Uh, I'll go ahead and close the public meeting. Oh, I didn't even have to have a public meeting because it's the first reading. Um, but uh, I think we will take a vote. So, Judy, if you could call the roll. Yes, Kenneth, are you voting? Recused. Okay. Stokes? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Housh? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so we are now into our resolutions, and the first resolution of the year uh, mm -hmm. that I love, uh, and I would like to have you read it in full, is 2019-01. Please, Judy. Yes, this is supporting the Agraria Trail in Yellow Springs, Ohio. Whereas the state of Ohio, through the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, ODNR, administers financial assistance for pub public recreation purposes through the Recreational Trails Program and or the Clean Ohio Trails Fund, and whereas Community Service Incorporated operates the Agra Agraria Center for Regenerative Practice, founded in 2017, and desires to connect Agraria to the Village of Yellow Springs and Yellow Springs High School Middle School on East Enon Road via a public shared use ADA compliant trail, the Agraria Trail, and whereas Council for the Village of Yellow Springs considers bicycle and pedestrian transportation to be of utmost importance to the community in providing the region with recreation and transportation opportunities, as well as supporting economic and community development, healthy lifestyles, and environmental sustainability. And whereas Community Solutions has been a trusted partner in the village for over 78 years, providing access to valuable publications and educational programs. And whereas Agraria offers both children and adults in Yellow Springs new opportunities for education and local food production through sustainable agriculture, permaculture, regenerative land use, and watershed restoration. And whereas the Agraria Trail is recommended to be completed as part of the re regional trails network by the ODOT ODH funded Yellow Springs Active Transportation Plan and is also supported by Greene County Parks and Trails, the Yellow Springs Senior Center, Yellow Springs Children's Montessori Co-op, and the Yellow Springs Chamber of Commerce. Now therefore be it resolved that Council for the Yellow Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, Section 1, hereby supports community solutions in its application to ODNR for Clean Ohio funding for the Agraria Trail, Section 2. This resolution shall be in effect immediately upon adoption. All right, thank you. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. All right. 
So I see Suzanne, or Susan has got a uh, visual. So we'll give you an opportunity to show us. So um, again, I'm Susan Brandon from Community Solutions. Um, most of you, or many of you remember that we bought a farm at auction about a year and a half ago now. This is um, East Dayton Yellow Springs Road. We bought 128 acres and our goal is to have a bike trail essentially cross the northern end of our property and we'll cross uh, Rick Donahoe's land that's east of the high school and, and uh, East Newman Road. And this would enable students to come um, from the high school and middle school without getting on a bus and also enable people from the village to bike out to a career day that could be very helpful. Or hike out, right? Hike out. Multi use. Yes. Yes, and you know, I always imagine uh, when this project first came up, thinking about our seniors that use the track to walk, and so instead of having to go in circles, they could actually have a nice little walk down to Agraria. And how how long is the trail? It's just under a mile. Great. Um, so, questions or comments from council? Uh, any comments from citizens? All right, excellent project. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh, Aye. Any opposed? Didn't think so. All right. Uh, thanks, Susan. And um, we're going to move into Resolution 2019-02. Judy, uh, title only, please. Indeed. This is authorizing the sale during calendar year 2019 of municipally owned personal property which is not needed for public use or which is obsolete or unfit for the use for which it was acquired by Internet auction pursuant to Ohio, Ohio Revised Code Section 721.15D. Okay. Can I get a motion? I move. Second. All right, Patty. Um, this is just our annual resolution that council passes allowing us to take our surplus property and auction it off on these two sites. We do have to be specific about which ones we're going to use. So these are the two that we have been using. Um, we have relatively good results with them when we auction off obsolete property. So this is just the regular course of business for the first meeting of the year. Questions or comments? Anything from citizens? All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. And finally, we have resolution 2019 03. Um, Judy, let's read that in full. <clears throat> all right. This is awarding a farm lease to farm all village farmland properties to JCW Enterprises LLC. Whereas the village owns farmland, which it rents for agricultural use, to wit approximately 53 acres of tillable land located on four separate parcels of village property. And whereas the village desires to enter into a one-year lease for the productive use of this acreage with JCW Enterprises LLC, the lessee. And whereas lessee acknowledges that part of this farmland is currently being used as tillable agricultural land. And whereas the village manager has negotiated a lease with, L with JCW Enterprises LLC, it takes into consideration the knowledge and professionalism of the lessee's operations, the condition of the land, soils, and productivity, the one-year nature of the lease, and other factors affecting rents for tillable acreage, specifically lessee's use of organic farming methods. Now, therefore, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby resolves that. Section 1, Village Council declares that these approximately 53 acres of tillable acreage are surplus property not currently needed for municipal purpose. Section 2, the village manager is hereby authorized and directed to execute the attached lease agreement, Exhibit D, for the 2019 crop year, April through November 2019, with such non-substantive changes as she deems to be in the best interest of the village. Section 3, this resolution is adopted under the home rule powers of the village and the procedures followed are hereby deemed appropriate and adequate pursuant to the laws of the village and compliant with existing rules regarding sur surplus property are hereby waived. Section 4, this resolution shall become effective immediately upon adoption. Okay. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. All right. What's that? Are you having any public comments? Sure. Oh, great. Yeah, but not oh, yet. Okay. Uh, but, but we're close. I'm going to let Patty intro and then yes. Um, okay, so as, as we mentioned to council previously, um, as opposed to us having to bush hog these properties and keep the grass cut on them, um, until such time as we develop them or use them for some other purpose, um, we would like, we wanted to do a, a, a crop lease on them. We put out an RFP, RFP we got three responses. Um, Jason was the only completely organic response. Um, the other two were, uh, did note the use of chemicals which we were trying to avoid on our properties to begin with, and the RFP was very clear about that. Um, so 
Johnny and I talked, we did a little research, and we recommend that we award this grant to, or this uh, contract to Jason Ward. 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 Yeah. Um, and so then just, uh, if I read correctly, um, 53 acres, $100 an acre, so we'll generate about 5300 um, that's correct, and then out of that we'll pay, uh, because it will, we will be earning a profit off of it, we will have to pay taxes on it. So okay. it, is a, it is a misunderstanding that the government never pays taxes. If we make money off it, we have to pay taxes on what we earn. Right. Um, but yes, that is, that is the case, and uh, he, the lease will specify the due dates of the payments and the final reports and all of that. Okay. And the other thing I want to mention before Susan gets up is um, I, I think everybody read the lease and we talked about this before. If we need to reclaim that property because there is a development project that can't wait uh, that is included in the lease. We right. would have to you know, pay damages, but yeah. it will not um, hinder any of our economic development. Uh, activity. Yeah, and it, and that did occur when when we sold the land to Cresco and Clem Farms was actually um, at that time farming the CBE. We were lucky that um, we were able Cresco was able to hold off on construction <laughs> until they were harvested, but otherwise we would have had to compensate Clem for the loss of the crops. Right. Right. So, Susan. I, could yeah, I would just oh, like sorry. to say that. Um, oh, come to the mic if you don't mind. So I'd like to say that Jason Ward actually is farming acreage at Agraria, and he's doing an amazing job. And we, um, I encouraged him to uh, apply to farm the village land because we would really like to extend our education that we're doing with Yellow Springs schools to Yellow Springs um, own land. And um, I would encourage the Environmental Commission and would be really delighted to work with them to use this as an educational um, opportunity mm -hmm. not just for Yellow Spring students but for um, villagers as a whole as to the difference between regenerative farming versus um, chemical based farming so, cool. so thank you thanks Susan Marianne did you yeah I, I just uh, wasn't clear about the property on the C formerly formerly CBE property mm -hmm. is it the smaller piece it's there both pieces both par both parcels oh okay we, we still own both of those parcels. The back parcel is the only one we sold off. Right. I, yeah, so I mean, just since we didn't, I guess, review it, you know, so we're talking about our property at, you know, what's currently known as the Center for Business and Education, mm -hmm. uh, our property at Sutton Farm, right? Correct. And then uh, the Glass Farm. Correct. All of those which, you know, we have goals around, mm -hmm. but uh, if we can you know, generate yeah. a little bit of revenue, and that I, never hurts. And I know it's confusing because there are a lot of red lines on there, but if you look at the heavier red lines. Well, that was the question because the heavier red line on here is this, just this small Yeah, piece. because I can only highlight one parcel at a time on the, so on and that. both parcels. On both that piece. one, it's both parcels. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, any other questions or comments? Kevin? I, I have a question that's, no pun intended, really deep in the weeds. Um, but so I don't know if anyone else knows much about this uh, local food initiative. Um, and so I just wondered if we knew what kind of crops were going to be grown there. Um, we haven't gotten that far um, yet. He's going to rotate them if, because he did ask for a three-year lease, and I said one year with one-year renewals. Um, so he's going to grow. He's going to rotate them, and I'm not sure what he's going to grow first. Okay. But okay. Maybe we'll reach out to him and see if. For example, if somebody wants to get oat milk locally to do ice cream, they can grow oats, and I don't know whether that's possible, but anyway, just trying to connect some dots. You'll hear more about it down the road. All right. I'm, I'm intrigued. Uh, and I love the education thing. I think that's really a cool thing we could take advantage of with an organic farmer, you know, farming so much land. Uh, I did want to ask about, so I saw a reference to the... Conservation Reserve Program contract in the lease. And I am not familiar with that document. So if that document exists, which I assume it does, could we have that in the next packet? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd just like to see what, I, I'm guessing this is something that was done uh, well in the past? Yes, and it's, um, 
I'm trying to find that particular reference in here. Um, I, I think it's actually a program. Okay. Well, I, I, yeah, I will so find it. Just because I'm curious to understand what that document is about. And, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it speaks to some of the things we've been talking about related to uh, properly managing our properties. Um, okay. Uh, any comments from citizens? All right. If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, we are now at citizen concerns. So this is the time on the agenda where we uh, welcome any comments about things that are not on the agenda. Uh, so do we have any citizen concerns? Okay. If not, we are moving into special reports and we have our very own Mayor Pam Canine here. All right. And uh, our clerk as well. And uh, Looks like we've got some good stuff to talk about. I am indeed Mayor Pam Canine coming to you tonight with Council Clerk Elise. Not Council. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <geez, I'm> <laughs> Look at this. Sorry, I'm, I'm you're Judy. mesmerizing. <laughs> <laughs> you are not Judy. With uh, the Mayor's Clerk, Clerk of Court Elise Burns. And what we thought we'd do, it's come to our attention that uh, council may have some questions or may want to have some clarification on the type of reporting that we send to council. So we thought we'd come appear before you and explain what it is that you get from us every month and see, in fact, if you do have any questions or just let you know that you can be in touch with us. Now, every month in the council packet, you get the mayor's court was submitted in your packets, be they electronic or hard copy. Those have been looking the same since January slash February when the new administration, if you will, took office. Uh, you can see, starting there January, February, you can see the type of information that is shared in this table. There are a couple of things that uh, Elise is going to clarify. But this, this should look familiar to you because it's, becoming, it's been coming monthly since the first of this year, last year actually. Quarterly is included in this, March, June, September, December, a report from the mayor as far as the activities that the mayor has been doing in, in office. In addition to the mayor's court, just so you're aware of what's going on there. Now where this table became interesting was somewhere mid-year when we started talking about the adoption of Resolution 2018-38, which of course is the, the one that was sending all misdemeanor cases to the mayor's court at the suggestion of the Village Justice Task Force, sending all the cases. And that in fact became uh, an actual resolution on October 1st of last year. So. We then started parsing the numbers a little differently, and I'm going to toss the ball to Elise now because I want her to explain a couple of definitions that may help you understand a little more about the type of information that you're going to see in this table. And that would be the difference between what is a charge in police parlance and what is an incident. Because those are two very different things, mm -hmm. and I know it's helpful to understand the difference because it's going to affect our interpretation of the data. So, Elise. Okay, so the first part of this is what is a charge? So a charge is just one singular thing that someone could get. Um, so let's say someone was pulled over for speeding. Um, maybe they also didn't have their operator's license on them. That's another charge, um, so no license. And maybe they also were... Um, when they found that out, they ran that and saw that they were driving under suspension, they had a license forfeiture and had been ordered to pay child support. So that's um, three different charges and that's under one incident. So the charge is just the individual thing that they were doing that's against the law. The incident is, or I guess allegedly against the law, um, and then the incident is the entire um, packet, packet of charges, so the bundle of charges. Um, so that's just 
that was one, those three charges together would be an incident. So one person got pulled over and had three different things, that's the incident. Um, so looking at our charges versus incidents, if you look at the one you get every month, um, let's look at December first. So the one you get every month says there were 41 charges from the police department and 21 were sent to mayor's court. And it says, so 51% went to mayor's court. Well, that doesn't look that great because, but that's out of all of the things that the police department's uh, sees that went to mayor's court. So if you look at the new charts that we made for you, um, I'm gonna look at December again, because that's a good month that added up evenly. Um, there are 28 incidents. So the incidents is the whole packet of those charges. Mm -hmm. Are we on the same page? Mm -hmm. Okay. And there were 17 incidents that were sent to mayor's court. And then the next line says incidents eligible but not sent to mayor's court. There were zero incidents that were eligible and not sent. And you can see that that goes from October through December. So everything that can be sent to mayor's court has been sent. Um, to provide a little bit more information, we have another chart below that. And it says incidents ineligible for mayor's court and reasons why ineligible. So as since this resolution passed, we have three months. We have October, November, December. And I'm going to look at December again since that's the most recent. Um, so there were 28 incidents total. 11 were not sent to mayor's court because they weren't ineligible. And then it gives the reasons why they were ineligible. So we have out of county, um, OVI, which or used to be a DUI operating vehicle under the influence, um, jailed or violent. We cannot see juvenile cases or child support cases um, or a second offense or enhancement. So if they have prior, sometimes they cannot come to mayor's court. Okay. Um, is that, do we have more to say about that? No, except I think this was the piece that council was really after. Yes. Because <laughs> on the front page, we were just saying, well, this is the number of cases we could see and we're right. eligible. But the why piece, mm -hmm. that uh, one, two, three, in the, in the top table on that first page, the incidence is eligible but not sent to mayor's court. Those numbers were very telling, as was the next column where, they, where we translated it into percentages. And I was very, very happy to see that October, November, and December, when this, the resolution became active, zero. We saw all cases that we were eligible to see in mayor's court, and that's a really good sign, and that was what the Justice System Task Force was looking for, so bravo. Yep. And to check up on that, I've been meeting with um, the sergeants in the police department, so they've been working with me to say, hey, this is, we, they, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go through incident by incident, I'll say, why didn't this one come to us? And They'll say, oh, this was, you know, they had priors for this or something like that. Hmm. Usually you can kind of tell if you look at it, so. Right. Mid-year, yeah. I sat down with, I uh, sat down with uh, Sergeant Watson twice. I sat down with Officer Knapp twice. And then uh, that was a responsibility that Elise assumed, and now she's doing that. So we're literally going through every police charge and tracking where it is that they're going. If they're not coming to mayor's court, why? So that's the piece that was missing for council, and now we're going to be able to track that. And we'll continue doing that for a while. I don't know how long we need to do it, but we're certainly on it now, and we'll keep going. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm super excited when I saw this, because you're exactly right. This is what we were looking for. And so Good. Elise, Mayor, Can Mayor Can I, and thank you okay. for... Uh, and I want to be real clear, Elise is the number cruncher. <laughs> <laughs> She's a computer guru. She knows to whom to report. She puts all the numbers in. She's reporting to our state Supreme Court and, of course, the, the other municipal court tracking programs that they use to keep track of what's going on here, and then all 302 other mayor's courts that are around the state of Ohio. So uh, she's, and she's very quick to, to get those numbers in, and I really want to thank her for being able to include December numbers, and I want to thank uh, Josh Knapp, too, for being able to sit down so we could get those to you in its entirety. Yeah, yes. I, I, I want to also just say that, you know, to me, this can, you know, be a model for the kind of research and reporting that we're talking about, you know, in general, to make sure that we're delivering on our, you know, guidelines for village policing. So yes. uh, it, it's clear that there was, you know, thought and intent in this, and, uh, you know, I, I look forward to seeing more of this kind of reporting. Glad you guys are working together. Very good. Um, I have a question, comment, I okay. guess. 
it seems like, what, 90 percent or maybe more of the cases that come to mayor's court are related to vehicles. Traffic. Yeah, that's correct. Traffic. And actually, that percentage is around 12.13 or something like that. So it's, it's right around 90 percent we see that's traffic related, and that's correct. We don't see that many criminal cases, which in my mind is could be interpreted as good news. So most everything is traffic. And I think when we enter into our next item of business that we'll be bringing before you tonight, when we look at our fine schedule and all the various things that are included in our ordinances for which we issue charges, you'll be able to see the bulk of that is traffic. Mm -hmm. So I guess I have, this is more maybe for the Justice Commission. Um, there's been this thought of restorative justice applied locally. Well, in traffic cases, like someone doesn't have their insurance or speeding or something, there's not so much necessarily, I think, the kind of restorative justice kind of things that people were talking about. Um, and so I guess what I'd like the Justice Task Force to be doing is, are there any other cases that the police are getting that could or should come to mayor's court that are more of the kind of cases that I think we've sort of thought about in terms of having a local justice system? I'm going to say no. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's recently, though. That's October through December, but I think so. Or, or maybe understand a little bit more. Maybe there isn't that much stuff happening. Maybe there's not that much stuff of people getting unruly or something. Or maybe they get so unruly <laughs> that they have to go to Xenia. I don't know. And we don't have to have a large discussion about it now. But it's just, I think, our, my concept anyway was the ju that the mayor's court saw more diverse cases than it is. And well, I think where it has, you know, big implications is in decisions we make around a prosecutor or a public defender and um, we need to be able to justify having those, uh, you, you know, elements to our mayor's court. And so, so I agree. I think this is something that we need to really think about. Um, will those dynamics change, or you know, is there? Uh, or we just those? have a well-behaved village. Well, if I can just interject, that come on up, chief. The December numbers give you an overview. So jailed or violent incidents, you know, they, those could not come to mayor's oh, court, fine. nor will they ever mm -hmm. come to mayor's court. <clears throat> what you're not seeing are cases, say, drug-related, and those have been coming to mayor's court. We can break those down in your, but they're not in the overall, um, I think, we had December. Three of the last we had three. Yeah. So we are, we are seeing a transition in different types of cases that are heard. It's just not itemized out here. I get, how violent is violent? Let's say two people outside the, I'll say the gulch, get into an argument. Maybe there's some pushing back and forth. Officer comes up, cites them for what, on disorderly conduct maybe that, or something. That could be the charge. Then could that go to mayor's court? Yes. Um, assault? Have one person attacking another one in a violent manner? No. Okay. So there's there's the line. Somewhere. <laughs> I hope that helps. Yeah. 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 Well, again, I think ultimately it it's going to impact the decisions we make around what we invest in mayor's court or, or you know if mayor's court changes and and again you know that prosecutor public defender thing is is on the list to look at. Um, so I think we're going to need your help to figure out uh, are those things that make sense for us or not. And I do want to say, since I'm standing here, a huge thanks to Elise. She's done an amazing job. Um, the mayor has really transformed the department. The communication with the officers is uh, exceptional, and it's a joy to have you around. No, great. Kudos. Thank you. <laughs> and to, to your point, Marianne, I've been to both restorative justice conferences held at Antioch since, since those started and since I was in office. My guiding question during that was always, how can I apply what I'm learning here and hearing here into the mayor's court? 
And for the life of me, I was having a difficult time thinking, you know, you get someone in court, it's, it's a statutory court, a law has been broken, how do we circle up in the true fashion of restorative circles and have people discuss? I don't see it, the, I don't see it as something that is well suited to a courtroom. I see it as something that is, can dovetail nicely with the village mediation program and that, that sort of venue. And in fact, we have talked about this and expanded village mediation to include aspects of restorative justice. And please bear in mind too, during mayor's court, I put everything through a lens, a, a, restorative, a restorative lens, if you will, restorative processes. How, what can we do? And then we've had several opportunities in, in the court while protecting the village liability to use some methods with some of the, not, not the traffic issues, but with some of the criminal charges to have folks go in the community and perform certain acts of public service, so forth, in lieu of fines or at least made an attempt to do that. Mm -hmm. So we're putting things through that restorative lens mm -hmm. in, in what we do in the court. Okay? Um, so anything else before we transition into fines? Okay. All right. When taking over as mayor, one of the charges I was given within the first couple of weeks, truly, by the, both the police department and by the village governance up here, was take a look at the fine schedule and get that updated. Our fine schedule, fee schedule for infractions uh, that have been committed has not been updated since 2009. So it's 10 years out of date. I believe that Yellow Springs Mayor's Court is by far, on average, one of the lowest, the fee schedule <coughs> here is one of the lowest in the area, and Lisa's gonna speak to that in a minute. So I want Elise to take over and tell how we went about working our updating of the fines. Um, so we have a small part that we've added to the last <coughs> you look at the very last page, and I'll read over this. Everyone in the audience or listening at home can uh, just kind of watch right at the bottom because we want to have more information for you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so if we're looking at very last page here. So this is just a note that uh, the mayor wanted to include. Um, the classifications of misdemeanors. So we only see misdemeanors in mayor's court. So that's what we're seeing here. Um, so we start with minor misdemeanor. Um, the maximum state fine is 150. Fourth degree is 250. Third degree is 500. Second degree is 750. And then first degree is 1,000. So those are the maximum fines. Those are not set by us. Those are within the ORC. Um, so if you wanted to look up the Ohio Revised Code, you could find those numbers there. Um, she just wanted to include that to show why some of these numbers might be in here. Um, so we've come across, we've decided upon these numbers because we haven't had this uh, fine schedule updated in quite some time. You've seen the old fine schedule. Some of them didn't even have fines. It just said must appear. Um, some of them are a little bit random. They say $85, and you don't know why this one's 85 and this one's 150. So our main objective here was kind of to try to get it more uniform, to make it, you know, make the fines make more sense, and just have a set fine sort of. And then if there's an enhancement, um, which could be, let's see, um, right away for a public safety vehicle is a little more. That's an enhancement. It's a little more serious than just right away. You're right away for an ambulance or something like that is um, a higher degree, if that makes sense. So um, so these ones are more uniform. We're trying to keep them kind of in tail with what, with what the rest of um, the area is doing. So I've looked at different fine schedules for different areas. Um, I compared to St. Bernard, Waynesville, Lincoln Heights. These are smaller towns that are comparable in size to us. I don't know if they sound familiar at all. Mm -hmm. um, I also looked at uh, Hilliard and a few others. So we looked at their schedules, see what they've been doing, um, and tried to keep ours in up to date with theirs and then um, makes to make more sense. Um, so I've had one that I received that said we have two fines. A moving violation is 140, and you know parking is 
45 or something like that. So I kind of we kind of liked that idea, but we couldn't exactly go with it. Um, so some of these, that's how where we came across these finds. Um, so can I ask about a few? Sure. Can um, I say one more thing? Yeah, sure, sure. So these are the maximum fines. So okay. these are up to the mayor's discretion. So these are the ones that are on here. It, depending on the situation that she's going to see at court, she most likely, or you know, sometimes is going to reduce these fines. So I mean, speeding is just what what it is. But different things may, you know, there may be a different situation where it's probably going to be less, especially with the thousand dollar ones. Do you want to speak to that? Yes, and, and back to Mary Ann's point, if you look at th the, at least on the first page, the minor misdemeanors, look at all the, the preponderance of 120. Those were the ones that were dancing around in the area of anywhere from 85, 95, 110. So in taking an average of those numbers and, and bumping it up $10 for the pleasure of the council who wanted the fines raised, a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit, I wanted you to bear in mind two things. The mayor will not lower charges. The mayor will not change a charge. Okay, it's the interpretation of the state Supreme Court and many other legal entities that a mayor in a mayor's court cannot lower or reduce a charge. That's under dispute currently with the ACLU, and there may be some changes in that. But for, for this court right now, the mayor doesn't change charges. However, the mayor can change fines. I can do whatever I want with the fines. So I want to be very clear, Council, when you're looking at these numbers, I have never, never given issued a $1,000 fine for a first-degree misdemeanor, which I have heard. <laughs> I have, by the way, the way the sequence of misdemeanors, minor misdemeanors, et cetera, runs, Think of it as sunburns, a first degree burn is like the worst you can get, okay? So the first degree, first mis degree misdemeanor is the worst you can get, and then they run down from there to minor. I have never issued a $1,000 fine. I've never issued a $500 fine. So I'm very, very careful and very judicious in the spirit of Yellow Springs with how much fine is actually assessed. Sometimes if a person has three or four charges, I'll take two if they're comparable charges and merge them and just charge the person one or part of one fine. And I think it's important that you understand this. So a lot of it depends on uh, what the person brings with them to court, what they say or don't say, how they plead their case, and the facts of the case as it's presented in the police reports as well. So. As you're looking at this, I want, I want you to, you'll look at the old schedule and you'll say, well, gee, this was only uh, 200 in the old schedule for this third degree misdemeanor. Well, and in fact, it will probably be less than 200 now. It's just, this is the top. This is the high ceiling I want you to see. So uh, you can't change charges. So, but what if someone comes, let's say they, were charged with uh, running a, or, or, or not coming to a complete stop at a stop sign. Mm -hmm. And they come and somehow or other they provide evidence that says, I did come to a complete stop. Are you able to find the person like not guilty? Yes. Of a charge? Yes. So you're I not changing the charge, charge, but you're saying you don't find that they, that the charge was. Correct. That they're guilty of that charge. It's, and there have been over the, the year, several incidences of people who've brought in photographs and, and witnesses. And that, that to me is the true intent and purpose of the mayor's court. When I can say, come on, approach the bench. You know, the person's nervous, they've never been in court before, but they manage to take photos of, of the intersection or whatever it is they're questioning. And they have photos with them, perhaps moms with them or someone, and they come up and they say, well, this is what happened. I'll listen to them. I'll look at the police report, I'll listen to the facts, because the officers are in here too, the charging officers, and if there's any factual information they can present, then we'll listen to all sides and judgment is rendered. So there have been a couple, three, four, five, six cases where uh, charges have been dismissed. 
and traffic violations. So a couple of things I wanted to ask about. So display of license looked odd to me because in the old version it was eighty dollars and now it's a thousand. And I understand the qualification about maximums and whatever, but I I guess I don't understand that one in particular why it's you know eleven twelve times more. Dis you know, displaying licenses and being a licensed driver is one of those sacrosanct areas. But this is license plate, I think. Well. At least if I looked at it from before. And so that has to do with mm -hmm. the license, the car being adequately licensed and us able to verify who it is and so forth and so on. Okay. Brian, what number is that? Because 436.09 yeah. 436 is 120, display of license plates. So display of license means... That one is uh, your driver's license? Your OLN. What's the number? Yeah. Vehicle plates. Okay. So I think I'm right that it used to be 80 on the old one and that it's 1,000 now. So there's another one that's display of license plates, registration, obstruction. So that's a different one as well. Is that what you're thinking Some of? of these are parsed out in many different ways, and it depends on how the officer writes the ticket as to exactly yeah, what's going to appear. Display of license plate. Um, okay. I mean, so anyway, that one looks strange, but if it's not, um, and then I guess that did bring up a general question though about like there's the one that's also a thousand about if you have multiple licenses or whatever, and I assume that means, you know, driver's license in this case. So these are, you're saying are the sac sacrosanct, like they're just really they are, terrible. But, uh, what we want are licensed drivers where everything is legal, where a uh, registration matches up with the license, matches up with the plate, with a little sticker on the plate. Mm -hmm. That's really, really <coughs> important, and, and the Ohio Revised Code recognizes it as such, and that's why you get things like displaying and add a okay. verifiable <coughs> license is, is an M1. That's the highest one. Okay. Now, again, that said, I very well might take a look at that sure. inside. Sure, I understand. Okay. 100 bucks. I, th I think I understand the answer to your question, because if you look at the old um, P schedule. Uh -huh. There are literally four different display of license, and they have to do with some with license plates and some with the, your driver, your operator's license. Okay. And the one that's an M1 on the old fee schedule is 450735, which is failure to show your driver's license to someone when you're in an accident. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why it's a higher charge, Chief. Is that you're talking? That the state 450735. Yeah, 450735. Okay. Yeah, and mostly I just asked, not because I'm doubting, but that one was, just looked was confusing. strange. Yeah. So, um, I mean, and I just wanted yeah, to make sure it wasn't a mistake. Or yeah, something. it's an M1 is okay. why. When I, get the, when I get the docket for court, just to your point, Brian, I go through <coughs> each charge, I look it up, I correlate it with both the Ohio Revised Code and our ordinance to make mm -hmm. sure I understand what's coming in front of me. And some of those are very nuanced. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, you've got to really parse down and do some reading to figure out mm -hmm. what it is exactly that is going on. Cool. Well, I, I, I do want to say I appreciate that these are maximums, that the purpose of mayor's court is to think about what makes sense. And I liked your comment in the report about, you know, trying to get people back on the road to get to their jobs rather than like have them paying all these large fines that mm -hmm. don't really make sense. So I think that's really important because we don't want a mayor's court that is just trying to like fund local government. Oh, no. But right. we do want a mayor's court, I think, that can cover its costs. And so I, I appreciate that you guys did that careful look on fines. Okay. So. so if this is the route that council wants to go, we need to do an ordinance. Okay. So um, just let me know. I'm not trying to push you one way or the other. I'm just saying we need to take that action if we want to change the fee schedule. I think we do. Yeah. Right? Okay. 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 Um, I'll take care of it. Great. Other questions or comments from council? Questions or comments from citizens? All right. Mayor Pam, Elise, thank you so much. Very welcome. Appreciate the report. And uh, yeah, I'd like for you guys to do a, um, a next quarter a report as well. And, you know, just to kind of like follow up on these collaborations and progress that we're making. I think, uh, at least in the short term, sure. this is a good thing for us to keep doing.
it's our full intent to keep that going until Great. council says, hey, we're, we're on track here, the new justice task force iteration. We'll see what happens, but so far so good. All the right. are good. Thank you. thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we are into old business, and uh, we just have one item, which is the village manager search update. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll say a few things, and then I'll, uh, if Patty and Judy have anything to add. I, I'm going to stand up for a minute. Yes, mm. please do. Um, yeah, we all sit way too much in our current lives. Um, so, uh, first thing being that hopefully everybody noticed that the uh, village manager brochure is on the website. It is posted on Facebook. I have been sharing it. Uh, on my different pages. Uh, actually, I did that mostly today. A lot of other people have started sharing my posts. Mm. And so I want to make sure that we are all, you know, doing our due diligence about getting the word out. And the best thing to do is always point people back to the website, right? right? So um, the other thing I can update is that we unless council has any objection, Lisa and I want to move forward with the LinkedIn. Um, I recently clicked on a job for the city of Tigard, which is in Portland, Oregon, and was thoroughly impressed with how they are doing their search. I mean, I got this automatic message that was really welcoming, and it was like, we need them to like advertise our job and actually I have since spoken with the woman um, that's in charge of their hiring process of uh, its part on their team about just kind of their strategy in doing this they're they're a much larger municipality but I was really impressed with just kind of the messaging I got back and how quick they were to respond and all of that um, and uh, we uh, would like to uh, ex extend the support a little bit with Bing Design to facilitate that. Um, uh, uh, you know, just full, full disclosure, uh, you know, they charge us 500 to do the brochure and all the graphic design and everything. They've mentioned another 250 to get our LinkedIn piece set up. And then a good way to do this LinkedIn stuff, similar to Facebook, is some boosting. So if it's okay with everyone, and you know we kind of cap it at a thousand, which is save you know savings of about ten times of what we did last time, uh, I think we can get a lot of bang for our buck. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming there are no major objections on that. Um, Patty and Judy, things you want to add? Um, we have also advertised um, on. Uh, ICMA, International City County Management Association, uh, OCMA, which is the Ohio subsidiary of the International, uh, the, the Ohio Municipal League, the National Forum of Black Public Administrators, and the International Hispanic Network. Great. Thank you. Have we sent it to any local universities like that have schools of planning like UC? And Right state? No, I I haven't. I don't know if Judy has. And I wonder if there is any association of of um, universities that have of uh, planning departments in universities. Mm -hmm. Pl well, planning or public administration. Public administration. Um, there, UC has one. Northern Kentucky University has one. It's where I went. Uh, Wright State has one. Um, most of the students belong to the American Society of Public Administrators. Um, that's normally one that welcomes students um, to participate. Um, so, so I so I think yeah, if we could, I mean, I like that idea. Um, that also made me think about um, the APA, the American Planning Association, because you know I, I do think. Uh, you know, that planning background is something that we flag. So I don't know if they have uh, something we can do. Um, I'm, we sure that, I'm sure they do. Um, so just so I'm clear, you want to advertise this in the graduate schools? I'm thinking of primarily of people that teach there. I'm not Maybe sure how someone it, who's gone back to school. Yeah, I'm not sure how I, 
let me think on that one. I, I think, think it would be, if, if there's some kind of, if they've got some good alumni mm -hmm. connections yeah. set up, then, then I think it would be worthwhile. Uh, if not, we may be able to capture those people through LinkedIn. Well, that, yeah, that's what I was trying to say. Yeah, you want to that, talk? Yeah. Um, when I first started working on our LinkedIn strategy, um, I came up with some search terms that were geared off of um, our uh, position description because that's how LinkedIn searches. Um, they, they're looking for certain keywords to pop mm -hmm. up on someone's resume. Mm -hmm. So um, out of those came some planning organizations, um, some individuals, some consulting groups. So that's, I think that's a really good way to leverage LinkedIn um, mm -hmm. because then they kind of, as, as Brian said, you post something there, maybe even as a, a personal message to someone to say, hey, I don't know if you're interested, but we're looking for this, and then it starts to split off as people forward it. So that's a real advantage of using that approach. Um, I'm also thinking of community development organizations. So I, I'm, I will send it to the Ohio CDC Association, and there, there may be some national associations, people that, that maybe are the head of a large community development organization. Well, I, I do have a smaller ad um, that I worked on as opposed to the full five pager. The ad references the, the full five pager, which is oh. on our website. So I can send that out to everyone yes, if you want to share. Would be it's cool. I, I would challenge every community member who's watching this to think of three to five people that they know somewhere in the United States <coughs> who have the kind of characteristics that we're looking for and that they would forward this opportunity to that person and ask that person to forward it with their network. This will be the key. If everyone who's watching this does that, we will find great candidates. Um, there was something else I was going to say. Uh, related to the, the search part. Um, Judy, did you have anything else to add? Well, only that key to finding those excellent folks is getting a really viable, diverse, representative group of folks from the village who are going to help us in that process. And yeah. um, so we have till the 11th to, to get you. I've reached out and wrangled some people into the fold, but uh, we really need some more folks to, to step up. It's super important. So this is, yeah, uh, the citizen committee piece, yes. um, which so far we've got three people or more? Uh, we got another, yes, to okay. this evening. Uh, uh, that have expressed interest. Um, remember, uh, uh, according to our timeline, Kanetta and I will be interviewing people starting next week. So, you know, we, you know, we've put out there eight people that are committed to help with this process. And they would get started right away helping us brainstorm things like this. How do we get the word out, right? This is, this is a big part of the process. Um, oh, I know. I wanted to mention the, was it the city beat that? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, um, yeah, so the chamber um, donated mm -hmm. ad space that they had in uh, Cincinnati city beat for um, promoting this. So mm -hmm. I want to thank them. And, uh, you know. Oh, actually, Chambers of Commerce might be another place, the national. Here and sharing it. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, so share broadly. You know, that's definitely important here. Um, were you going to say something else, Pat? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so that's mostly where we're at update wise. Um, at our next meeting, uh, we will have a slate for <coughs> to recommend for the Citizen Committee. Um, and uh, we want to continue sort of working together. Judy had a really good idea about sort of a, an internal core team that's project managing all of this and thinking about that more intentionally. So uh, we're going to talk more about it, and I'm sure another council member or two council members will be tapped to be part of that, um, as well as, you know, I guess Judy's thinking about being involved and maybe Patty. Mm -hmm. So if so. someone's interested and has questions, they should call Judy? Or Judy or me, either one. Okay. And I, you know, and I, I, I want us to think more about this. But based on that interaction I had with the city of Tigard, um, I, I mean, in my mind, if 
an interested party wants to reach out to any council member, I don't see why they can't. I mean, am I, I mean, or if they wanted to ask us questions okay. yeah. about, you know, like, hey, I'd like to learn more about your community's culture or your council goals. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we could think more intentionally about that as we launch the LinkedIn part. But again, I really liked that, you know, right away they started communicating with me and making me interested in that job. <laughs> oh. So, <laughs> but right now I'm interested in uh, our job, which is to find a, a really good village manager. Um, okay, so anything else? Nope. Can, are we ready to go on to new business? Yes, we are. Um, I'm, I'm gonna request that we move the scenario-based training report up so that Chief and Florence don't have to sit here for the rest of the Sounds evening. Good. Forward. That sounds good. So, uh, why don't you guys come up? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So, um, Brian had an idea a while back, Councilman House, to try to work scenarios with officers, specific situations. Um, we've kind of taken that idea, we're slowly migrating into what I think is going to be a unique training process. When you talk scenario-based training and traditional policing, it's decision-making in the spur of a moment. We wanted to kind of look at this from diff a different lens, if you will. How would we handle each specific situation? Not necessarily shoot or don't shoot, but how we mediate, how we assess, um, how we de-escalate, and how we can escalate. And so what we've done is, which I think you all have the links to, I wanted to make it so it's accessible to everyone. When you have a chance, you know, in your free time, uh, just kind of pick through some of these and take a look. I put it out to the department for uh, officers, dispatchers, and everyone in the department to, to come up with some ideas. And at first, honestly, I, I thought we were going to get, I was going to get incidents where, you know, gosh darn, the officer was right. Mm -hmm. And I, in fact, I got just the opposite. So there's some really good things in here. There's some horrible things, too, things that you just look at and just make you cringe that this person is in a uniform. And those are very obvious. Um, we also did get some where the citizens aren't such great people either. And those are very obvious as well. But it's the kind of the, the ones in, in the middle where we were able to assess. And so on December 4th, we met as a team, talked about the idea. I put it out to everyone who would like to be on the committee. Um, Florence, Naomi, Mark, Charles, and myself uh, create, created this scenario-based training committee, and um, then we did our first four-hour session. The first session, we did not act anything out. What we did do was watch each scenario and then discuss them. Everything stayed in the room. Nobody's opinion was wrong. Um, some things that we did note after the full four hours was that in each situation, there's I, I hate to use the word a trigger, but there's a key moment when either the citizen or the officer severs and you can see where it either escalates or de-escalates. And those are the parts that we really wanted to take note of. Also, in the situations where officers are doing things that create that visual uh, negative, if you will, um, things like, and things words that we, we don't like but exist, you know, control punches. We don't use those in the Yellow Springs Police Department, but they do exist in training. Um, so those kind of things were talked about. It was interesting <coughs> for me to throw out kind of the, the way out there idea and, and everyone, as Florence, you remember in a couple situations, you know, just looked at me and was like, no. <laughs> and I said, okay, well tell me why. And you know, they were right. And, but it's throwing these ideas out and bouncing them off each other that really made a difference. It was, it was engaging. It was four hours of training that went by really fast. Yeah. And so I'm excited about our next uh, session. Would you like to add anything? No, I don't know. 
Well, <laughs> Lauren said earlier, she said, Chief, do I need to be at the, and initially I said no, and I came in tonight a little late, and there she was. In the uh -huh. She said, I wanted to come and give support for the, yeah. Well, how are things going with Lauren? I think they're going well. Yeah. They're improving um, communication and the collaboration with um, other um, departments and entities that, um, Chico Police Department. <coughs> um, dealt too much with the coroner's office this <laughs> these mm -hmm. last few weeks. Mm -hmm. yeah. But um, we've had some good conversations and some good follow-up um, about um, how we can help the, those who are left, the family members, the friends, the family. So that is um, one area. I did want to say um, something about the scenario-based training. Um, actually, um, during that training, it actually triggered some trauma in um, those working with the police department because this, they work with this every day and the dispatchers and the officers are there communicating. It's like, you know, they're their hands, eyes, ears on there. And so it did trigger some trauma. And so we did have to do some, um, a little bit of counseling after this because of what it triggered in the officers or in the dispatchers. Mm -hmm. So it, it's real. It's yeah. you know, things that we do in life. You you know, you get in a situation, you don't know how you're going to react and you mm -hmm. don't know, but when you're in a life or death situation, some trauma can occur. So it did. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I have to say I watched some of the videos and other than the one that made me sick to my stomach and I had to turn it off, even some of the experiences that I have from many, many years ago when I dispatched, I thought, oh, wait a minute, this is a little too close to home. So you can't, you do need to be cognizant of that, and I'm glad you are. Yeah, well, I'm really, I mean, and I, I think it's important for these things not to be buried and, you know, to be, to come out and be talked mm -hmm. about and, you know, handled. Um, well, I'm super excited, and I know this is a really powerful technique, you know, I, I mean, I think a select few uh, police departments across the nation are doing this kind of training and getting a lot of benefit out of it, so thank you. Um, I also wanted to say, and I should have said this at the beginning of the meeting, uh, I loved our police team's presence at the ball drop. You guys were fun and great, and it was commented on by a lot of people, and also thanks to the entire village team. Mm -hmm. um, it was an incredible uh, ball drop, and it and, didn't and hurt that it was warm. Yeah, yeah, and the yeah. fire department. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I, I guess I think of them as the village team, too. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah it was really, yeah, it was amazing. I so. handed out a ton of candy canes. So, I'm just going to say. Yeah, you did. Uh, it, by the way, Florence did put together an updated uh, report that wasn't included in the packet. That was our my error, but it, she has a copy for everyone. Thank October, you. November, and December are on the back, and then the other side is the full year of, um, or since April. Mm -hmm. okay. The last thing I'd like to mention to the public, to council, um, if there is any type of scenario or incident, anything uh, related to policing that you feel we should consider as part of this, for part of this program, please forward it to me. My door is always open, and you can email me, um, and then we'll take a look at it. That's great. Can we post that on Facebook, Judy? Just that uh, if the public has suggestions for scenarios to contact the chief, that's like a great thing to put out there. Mm -hmm. I love it. And the other thing, too, is we have um, on our next uh, training, we have already volunteers to actually, we're going to play out the scenario because I think it's important for you to be on the other side and you say, well, I would have done this or why didn't you do that when you're in the the throes of what's going on, and you might react a little bit differently. Absolutely, and, and there was nothing secretive about this, but I want to baby step this and bring, because the officers, I, I feel if we have in the public in these initial trainings, then we will be reserved mm -hmm. in opinions and things that, you know, and I want it just to kind of be organic, and eventually it'll be fun. I think we can have participants, anyone who wants to volunteer, you know, it'll be a real community effort. So, so are you saying that for starters, you're going to keep all of the players, the role players within the department? The, this next one, I would like to invite 
council. Um, but we won't, the, the public overall, um, I think we're going to keep the closed doors only because we're all a little embarrassed at the acting yeah. part of it. Yeah. And that's what we do in it's this. It's very so. vulnerable, making people very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it'll be very similar to the roles and the, the, the scenarios that uh, CIT training does. In fact, the two volunteers mm -hmm. that will be helping us, that's what they do. And they're fabulous mm -hmm. at it, so. Perhaps some of the council members would volunteer to yeah, act I, out a part. Yeah. See? I'll do it. I'm um, sure we yeah, have at least yeah, five. We definitely yeah, want to be here. We'll be able to switch those roles as well, so you will be able to view it as the officer, mm -hmm. um, which that I think is important as well. Sure. Definitely. We, need, we want to develop that empathy. Indeed. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Thank Florence. Thank you. Thanks. Excellent. Um, okay. Next up, we have uh, Board and Commission assignments. And uh, Judy did a nice job of putting together what she heard from our mini retreat. Um, so we don't necessarily need a lot of discussion, um, but in particular, if there's anything that uh, someone heard or thought differently about. And then um, I guess I could also explain the little surprise that I put on there. Uh, I had mentioned at our mini retreat that I'd like us to consider, not tonight, um, an active transportation enhancement committee to implement our uh, active transportation plan that would be part of planning commission, um, like the bike enhancement committee used to be. Uh, so I just wanted to put it on everyone's radar, but we'll make it more of a official topic later. Okay. Um, so yes, Marianne. Yes, I have a comment. At one of our meetings, Brian, you suggested that people not only go to the commission or board to which they are the liaison, but they also go if they're the alternate. Yes. And I would like to protest that. Okay. I think it is unreasonable. I mean, like, I have five commission and boards, plus I don't know how many alternates. I, I am not planning on going as an alternate to a commission <coughs> unless there, as an alternate, unless there's Unless I know the the person can't come, or if there's some particular reason I need to go. Right, but just I, to be clear, what I but, said was well, that I think finish. you should you but should what go. But I let once. me finish. Okay. Okay. Not really okay. Right. Once. Okay. I didn't hear the once. I do think that we should be sending out the agendas, the minutes uh, of a commission to the alternate, which mm -hmm. I have to say, I have not done the Environmental Commission. We haven't been doing that. Um, and I think the alternate should read those. But That's a great okay, idea. I misunderstood. Right. So no, I, I thought just you meant, said they should go meant, to every single meeting. Right, because, for example, like I don't think Kevin's ever been to an ESC meeting. So I, that's what you've been to one. Okay. Because I wasn't there. Because okay. she wasn't there. But, but, but I did understand your encouragement to come to go more regularly. Right. I mean, or at least just, I, and again, I don't mean every time, unless mm -hmm. you want to, but just more to, so that you're a known entity, you know, to that committee uh, in case you have to sub. Yeah. So anyway, that's what I meant. And I think, however it happens, continuity is the key so that when you do have to step in as liaison, you're not stepping in into a vacuum. I mean, you have right. had the opportunity to keep up, um, you know, Marianne as liaison for HRC. She keeps up. I get the minutes. Uh, Karen sends out the minutes, and I get those uh, regarding the ESC. I've already started hitting up uh, Kaneta on HRC stuff. Uh, once I saw this, I said, "Okay." <laughs> yeah, I wasn't. I didn't know it was mm. final. But, well, and, and that was one that was uh, a, a a question mark. Mm -hmm. um, but again, uh, you know, because the alternate's not expected to be there regularly, mm -hmm. that's why. And when I actually looked, counted up everybody's assignments, it looked like. That would roughly make us even. Mm -hmm. So, if, if that's okay with you, yeah, Kenneth. that's okay. that's what I was thinking. Um, great. Anything else about boards and commissions? Um, just I, I don't know who all's doing. Um, I think it's understood that if there's a retreat, uh, that certainly all hands on deck. You know, liaison, primary, and um, alternate. Yeah, I mean, I it it is part of every commission ordinance now uh, that you can. Can and sort of are encouraged to have a retreat. So 
It's a great thing to do, especially now that we're thinking more about budgets mm -hmm. uh, across commissions and you know planning our goals. And I agree with you, Kevin. I think if the alternate can go to that, then you've got that sort of exposure mm -hmm. about what's going to be happening that year. Right. Great. Um, I, Kevin brought up something that I'd like to mention. We have twenty-five thousand dollars to be divided among commissions. Yes. Right? I don't think that it's necessarily appropriate to assume that, for starters, everyone gets the equal share. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, HRC has had a history of providing small grants and $8,000, $10,000. Mm -hmm. Environmental Commission, while I'm sure there are some things that we could use it, we haven't been doing that. So to me, it makes sense for HRC to get start off the bat thinking they're going to get more money. <laughs> Would it, wouldn't it be appropriate for each of us to bring a proposed budget for our, our commission mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah. kind of make a case for it? I mean, be, this is yeah. precious. These are precious resources. So I think if we're, if we come up with a budget, just like any business, of what our plan spending is, then we can argue for our budget. Mm -hmm. And that's what I understood. I didn't know if it was just in the conversation, Brian, between me and you about that approach. Uh, so uh, HRC certainly does plan. Uh, in fact, they would have done it this past week. But right. I had a greater sense of urgency about it. But um, you know, knowing that we still had a, a couple of months, I mean, we're going to meet our, our retreat is later this month, and right. we will do the budget. So we'll come out of this month with a budget. So yeah, that's the, that was the plan. Yeah. So. And, I, and with that, I sort of anticipated, to Marianne's point, that we would still end up just about <laughs> where we've been in the past. Um, we had conversations about you know, the things that planning might do for um, a glass farm and whatnot, so, and, and housing committee, if they're going to do something. So I think there's been enough conversations about where the dollars might fall. Uh, but barring uh, a couple of outliers, I would expect that the dollars would just about end up where they did in the past, mm -hmm. as long as HRC gets the percent. I, I, I'm tongue in cheek on that last comment, but 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 right. we do anticipate serving the community at about the same level we have in the past. Sure. You know, so if we if we come much shorter than that, you know, we'll just have to make some tough calls. Right. Well, I think I, I mean here's a couple things. So. You know, I originally when I kind of put out this idea of like reserve, you know, this kind of first cut, you know, and then anybody that doesn't request dollars, mostly what I was thinking about is that I want every commission to have an opportunity to make that case. So, you know, I like what Lisa and Kevin are saying around like how we make that happen. The other thing though I do think is important to remember is um, the HRC used to be the only place to go. Right. So now some of those grants that were requested from the HRC are being requested through the Arts and Culture Commission because it makes more sense. For example, supporting pride. That's something that should go through the Arts and Culture Commission because that's the cultural piece. So, you know, I think that, you know, arguably the same things are going to get hit. We just now have other commissions that are up to speed and thinking about this as well. Right. Um, but I love the idea if we can all get our commissions, you know, in the next month or two to figure out what they need, because it shouldn't be request just what's the most money I can get, right? We want to be thinking about the goals of, you know, the village and, and, you know, what we're trying to do. And I guess I do think it's important that we think more broadly about our environmental goals as well as our human relations and arts and culture and you know, the one or two others that might be viable. But like all that's good, and I wrote down, I think, at our uh, January 22nd meeting, we should nail down what our approach is gonna be to this budget. Um, could I also yes. make a suggestion, since we are talking specifically about grants that have been asked from one commission that may now be asked of a different commission, you want to make sure that you don't have overlap mm -hmm. because some people may assume that the second commission is a new source as opposed to an alternate source. Mm -hmm. And so you want to make sure that you don't have two commissions funding the same um, 
organization necessarily. You want to make better, you know, the best use of funds. I'm not. I'm not saying they have to be mutually exclusive. Right. But, but did we did we create a standardized form to address this? Where so you I, like I can actually that's uh, on our um, ACC agenda. Um, ACC looked at the um, form that HRC uses, and we thought it looked great and would be completely suitable to be used across the board, but we never closed the loop on that and said we were going to do that or we were not. So perhaps if if that's, yeah, just put it mm -hmm. at the top that, you know, you can see. Select from, one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, we're looking at it again. That was the meeting that I wasn't there, <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, well, I love that. And then if we can figure out on the 22nd which of our commissions are actually even going to mm -hmm. potentially, Submit. you know, ask for funds, mm -hmm then we can adjust the form accordingly, <coughs> right? So I will acknowledge, you know, the whole, I, I don't believe that we'll end up doing the, take the 25 divided by six and end up with four hours. But what that did do for us is it made us feel, HRC feel like we had a de facto at least $4,000 budget to respond to requests that we got right last week. Yep, okay. cool, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I can't imagine, right, I, I think that's a good way to think about it, is that, you know, commissions that have gotten budgets, um, you know, I would expect that and mm -hmm. probably possibly more. Right. Okay. All right. Um, okay, anything else about boards and commissions? Okay, let's talk about draft goals. And, yeah, I, I was telling Judy I don't know how I sent her the wrong document, but... Um, in some ways it's okay because this is an iterative process, so we don't need to go in a lot of depth, but um, the draft 2019 goals is not, there's no color coding because we're starting a new year. Um, and I'll highlight a few things that we talk about in our mini, treat, mini retreat and how this was developed. So, you know, there were some things that I had questions about, about, you know, resources and things. I updated all that. Anything that had been coded green is now gone because that meant it was completed. Anything that was yellow or red stayed. Um, I tried to do some adjusting based on the goals that I'm more connected to, but certainly housing Marianne is something that you'll need to go over with a fine tooth comb. And, uh, you know, we all kind of know where, where we're at. I did not receive anything from anyone uh, for this meeting, but uh, that's fine. We just want to make sure that we get this together for the 22nd. Okay, great. Um, so, you know, I, I love the idea like we've done it before. You know, take on the goals that are important to you. Send me the stuff that you want in there. I'll adjust the master document for us to look at at that meeting. Um, but I do want to flag that there was a new goal added, and that's on the second page, and it's at the top. Uh, so I'm going to read it, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Take action to avoid a deficit budget. Recognize the importance, uh, recognize the importance of right-sizing funds, some of which may reflect sitting on reserves rather than appropriately investing current taxpayer dollars. And maybe that could be worded a little bit better. But the point I was trying to make is two. One is the budget that we were presented with for this year, we started to see that we're dipping into our general fund. We need to be proactive about addressing that. Uh, the second thing I wanted to highlight is this whole idea about, um, and we've talked about several times, spending current taxpayer dollars on current projects and investing those and not just sitting on funds and building up a rainy day funds like the state of Ohio has done, which I think is a really poor idea. Um, so that doesn't mean that we don't have, you know, some coverage. And so we know that we, we go beyond what the recommended is by doing four months in reserves for all of our budgets. So we've got that in place already. So we've got that sort of safety net, um, but we shouldn't just be not spending dollars because that's not what local governments are supposed so to do. So are, are you making a distinction between just keeping money in the general fund as opposed to putting investing. money, no, not oh. investing, putting money 
aside for capital projects right. that maybe we're not going to do this year, but we know that we're going to need to do. Yes, right, definitely. Yeah, and that's why we moved such a right. large amount out of right. the electric right. fund. Exactly. Thanks for that clarification. So um, I try to think about the things that are specifically relevant to this goal, um, and, and I think it's a really important one. Um, so, uh, you know, no surprise, we've been talking about uh, trying to develop a paid parking strategy that's complementary to the community. Um, we're not going to get into a discussion about that today, but, you know, part of this is we have to agree as a council that these are, in fact, the goals that we want to pursue. Um, and, you know, that would come with community conversations that think about solving problems for residents and businesses while also being able to support our infrastructure needs. Um, uh, we have talked about this community partnerships idea uh, with the John Bryan Community Pottery and the fact that we have are investing 32,000 in that building. And I've had great discussions with their board about them sharing the cost, like we see with the library and others. Um, and I have mentioned the ball fields as another one that we need to think about. And we need to continue to think about where, how we can maintain the services and amenities that we have, but where we need support to do that, all right? It, it can't all come from tax dollars in some of these cases. Um, okay, so we, are, we need to start thinking about the levy renewal and what that is going to look like. Um, that is in 2020. So uh, basically we need a plan and um, part of that plan kind of, a. a relates to affordability, right? What do we actually need as far as an operating budget, all right, to support this? Uh, my sense is with us dipping into the general fund, we want to maintain this, but this is why I mentioned also looking at income and property tax and some of the things that Henry Myers, for example, has brought up that we said we would investigate. What is the proper kind of mix for all these things? I think that should happen this year so we come forward with a clear plan about how we keep the village at the level of service that our community demands. So that's what this goal is all about. Um, you know, we, uh, please digest it a little bit more. Um, otherwise, most of the other things should look familiar because they were on our goals from last year. They were just things that were future actions that are being moved up. So questions, comments about goals? And I'm, I'm gonna, I'm thinking we will cut this short since I know you didn't really get a chance to see this document, which I thought was in the packet, um, and we can have a more extensive discussion uh, on the 22nd. Um, Lisa, did you wanna? Yeah, I guess the, the one thing that um, I haven't begun to talk about with um, you all yet, but um, I, I'm uh, building my interest around the culture of health work that Brian has started and specifically learning more about the Reach Out um, Yellow Springs Clinic that is currently being hosted at the AME Church. Mm -hmm. um, and I've started uh, networking um, with Dr. Sharon Sherlock who um, I'm just amazed and really looking forward to inviting her to come to speak to council and then integrating into um, the goals, this idea that we have a culture of health. Mm -hmm. And just as affordable housing is important, mm -hmm. so is ad adequate health care for the people that we know who live in Yellow Springs who are poor and hungry and probably uninsured. So this is something that I'm going to want to bring forward um, personally um, and I, I, I don't feel really happy about adding a whole nother goal. I wonder if we could build it into the embody a village culture goal. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, I mean, it's this whole, it's, it's kind of a different thing, anti-racism, diverse community and culture of health. It's an obvious kind of, and this too. But I, I feel like we have so many goals, but it's something that's very important to me. Could it not be integrated into the first goal um, of an affordable community with a high quality of life? Yeah, it could go mm -hmm. there 
It mm -hmm. could go there too. I I think it's a little bit. Um, it's kind of a branch, but I think. Yeah, I mean, I, but anyway, I just wanted to bring that up. Uh, if if you're looking at these, where you see mm -hmm. um, health health issues in the village fitting. Are there some other additional? If it were that in that first go, uh, are there other resources in addition to what's already there that you think ought to be brought to bear? Um, yeah, I mean, I would. If it's a different group of resources. Mm -hmm. I think the resources, yeah, it's it's different. So I, I haven't, it's not really packaged to present to you yet, mm -hmm. but I do want to foreshadow. And I mean, maybe it does need to be another goal. So before I forget, this reminds me that um, I'd also like to do what we did last year with getting public input on our goals. So ideally, if on the 22nd we have a solid draft, um, that we can then put out through, like we did before, Facebook, Survey Monkey, the boxes. So I'd like us to think about that. I thought that was uh, really valuable. Um, the other thing I will mention that I added in here to flag is trying to do, uh, I guess it's under the budget part, trying to um, do the participatory budgeting this year. And so we need to plan now if we're going to try to do that. And um, for, for folks that aren't familiar mm -hmm. with that concept, mm -hmm. uh, some municipalities take a portion of their budget and put it out to the community to essentially vote on how that money should be allocated. Um, so uh, you know we need to think more about that, but I think the concept is, is a really good one. Marianne had brought it up initially, um, and I'd like us to talk about what that looks like. When but, I get their emails. Yes. Great. And this is also, I mean, this is actually related to, I guess, this how we maintain a balanced budget, all right? Because even though we saw, like, going into the red, once those funds are right-sized, I, I want us to always have a balanced budget, and I think we can figure out ways to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, anything else about goals right now? Uh, do citizens have any questions or comments about village goals? Things that we should have on our radar? Okay. Um, so, I think, Patty, you are up next talking about transient guest lodging. Um, Kevin had asked <laughs> to have a further discussion because he had raised some concerns about um, properties that had been long-term rentals uh, being converted to transient guest lodging and the renters being um, um, displaced. displaced, thank you, um, um, and having to find some place else to live. So um, in looking back at the recap of what has, was discussed before, uh, we did briefly touch on excuse me, how we wanted to limit that, if at all, how we wanted to limit the number of transient guest lodging um, other than the hotel or the bed and breakfast that have four or five rooms. Um, so when we're talking about this, we're talking more about the private homes that rent one or two rooms or sometimes rent the entire home um, as opposed to something that is a specifically a business that does room rentals. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, at the time that, that the transient guest lodging was discussed, council decided not to uh, limit the number of rentals in any way. Um, but because of Kevin's request, I went back and did some research on different ways that it could possibly be limited and you see the different, these are things that are done elsewhere. Um, Kevin, most of these are mentioned in the article that you sent out earlier today. Uh, but these are things that you could discuss if you choose to go down this road and limit uh, in some way transient guest lodging. Keep in mind that anybody who is currently got a permit to do transient guest lodging is grandfathered in. So this does not affect those that are currently out there. Um, these, these things, whatever you do would be in effect for future. So 
uh, let you take that discussion at that point. Okay. And, and, and I think I just want to be clear that I don't, I don't think anyone is um, anti-business or anti, um, you know, transient guest lodging. I mean, there's, you know, if it could be boiled down to one thing, and, and, I've, and I've alluded to it before, you know, we, we've got a housing needs, uh, housing advisory board and a housing needs assessment, and so we're all in agreement that there's a shortage of housing, and, you know, while we haven't done a whole lot to increase the number of houses or homes available, you know, if we just continue, uh, and I don't want to name any, any, any particular properties, but if we continue to allow properties where residents formerly lived in these long-term rentals or apartments or whatever they are, and then they're flipped over, um, you know, to transient lodging, I'm okay with the whole capitalist approach to things, but, you know, we have, if you could count the number of available properties, they just got decreased, you know, by a certain number. Mm -hmm. um, because, again, those folks had to do, go someplace else, someone who's had a convenient place to live, comfortable place to live for, in, in some cases, years, has had to move. And, and, and their former residence has been replaced by, some, by an, uh, a space that is empty most of the time. Um, provides greater income, probably on average, you know, to the to the landowner, but it's it's that particular example is not doing much to help us improve our housing situation. Um, uh, gr uh, certainly, anyone who's already, uh, as the document, as the report suggests, who's already doing transit lodging should be grandfathered in. Um, you know, if you build something that didn't exist and then you make it available for transit lodging, I mean, you haven't taken anything away from anybody, and that's the key point. I mean, if you're adding to uh, the community, adding to the pot, I mean, that's probably the best way to do it. Um, but I'm just concerned about us going in reverse when we've already acknowledged that we have a shortage of housing, you know, to give up some of that housing. Um, be it Airbnb or whoever the, and we pick on Airbnb because that's the standard, if you will, but mm -hmm. you know, whatever the transient lodging is. So um, I, I think these are good ideas. I mean, I don't think there's a simple solution necessarily, you know, but like I said, if we could boil it, if I could condense it down, is that one circumstance we'd like to eliminate where village, village residents are being displaced and a, what was formerly a long-term rental is turned into a short-term short, short -term rental. Um. And, and from, from an economic perspective, that's a different discussion. But I'm talking about from a human perspective, where someone is forced to, 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 to have to move somewhere else. So I'd like to jump in, because the Housing Advisory Board is in the process now of looking at what kind of strategies mm -hmm. we are go going to recommend to council to put in our housing plan. And one set of strategies involves existing buildings. So, not all, so there's the issue you're talking about, about a, something that's been long-term rental that's been now turned into short-term. There's also the homes that are bought, uh, sort of mod modest homes that are bought and flipped by someone and then resold at a much higher price with not maybe that much. So that, that's an instance of taking a, an affordable starter home maybe and making it so that the people who could have bought that home to begin with can no longer. So those are two, two situations of the same thing. And to me, it makes sense to really cons at least consider having short-term rental be owner-occupied, in other words, a room in someone's house or, or if they want to build an accessory dwelling on their, property. on their property, but to have a home or have a housing unit where no one's living at all that's only for short-term rental, I think is the biggest issue. I mean, because what, if you're on your own property, you know, you have an accessory dwelling, well, you might want to rent it long term, but 
then you might want to be able to have it there for family, or mm -hmm. you're, you're having it for income or something. But so that's my is idea. is this a discussion that um, be, we maybe want to involve the planning commission in to look at things like um, limiting um, number of units, uh, in, you know, buildable units for this in a particular zone, or I, and I'm just throwing that out. I don't know if we do or don't. I'm just curious as if that's an input. Yeah, I, I think that's valuable input. Um, I, I guess my thought is that maybe we need to have a second discussion that would then help frame what planning commission would be looking at. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, I think this is also a good one to, you know, try to have some extra effort to make sure that the community knows we're discussing this because okay. I think I think mm -hmm. it's pretty significant and um, but I, I also do want to emphasize what you mentioned Patty that a lot of municipalities are doing things like this right mm -hmm. I mean I'm sure it wasn't hard for you to find these kinds of policies mm -hmm. um, no. I mean when I, last time I went to New York and I was looking at Airbnb, like I discovered that it's technically illegal yeah. to Airbnb in New York, you know? And so like the, the few that I found, like, you know, it's kind of like at your own risk. Yeah, yeah and there's, there have been some very heavy, I know someone who has been levied a very large fine for uh, advertising uh, mm -hmm. property on Airbnb without the landlord's knowledge or whatever. And, um, and so somebody's in trouble having to pay money. And, I mean, you, you report the uh, one article I sent out. I mean, these, these are some of these places I'm maybe considering going this year. You know, that, yeah, you just. The entirety of Japan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, so, I mean, it's so, you know, we're a small little village, but we're starting to inherit some big city problems. And, and part of my motivation here is, is for us to not be caught unawares. You know, not let it get so far out of hand, so far out of control, where you know, we regret not at least talking about it sooner. Sure. So, Brian, what do you want brought back to the next discussion, I guess, um, in order to better frame that? Yeah, what do you guys think? Um, well, you said you want more of a public. Yeah, so I, I would definitely so, like people to know that we're discussing this. And so maybe advertising that we're going to discuss it, and right. maybe we can frame it like sort of pros and cons, options. Mm -hmm. and, and also, you know, we've got that list of our transient guest lodger, lodgings. Um, so contacting them uh, would be good because they would have very important input on this. Although I, it's interesting that they would all be grandfathered in and you would be seriously limiting their competition if, in fact, they were opposed. Right. <laughs> I mean, in a way, I... I'm I not saying they're the only stakeholders, but... I think they're relevant ones, right? Right. I, I always think it's a variance of practice when, when you actively solicit participants for particular discussions and don't do so for other discussions. I, my feeling is it should just remain consistent. We are consistent about those agendas go on Facebook, they go on our website, they go on the Yellow Springs News. They are consistently put out there, topics are are put out there, it's it's in the minutes, it's mentioned in the Yellow Springs News, it, it's put out there. I don't, I just think sometimes we might borrow trouble if we uh, actively seek participants in a particular discussion when we have not done so for other discussions. So I, I think that's a point well taken. So what I would like us to do is moving forward identify these kinds of discussions and do something more. Um, because I, you know, the flip side of that is when we don't have the people in the room that we need to hear from until way down the road. So it, that could be on Facebook and it could just be like, here are some key topics that we're discussing at this meeting, right? So we could have some kind of balance there that we could consistently employ. And part of that is on us as a council also to make sure the community knows when these hot button potentially discussions are coming up. So you would just have like the agenda and then something that said major topics of discussion will be yep. this, this, yep. this, and this. Right, because well, like goals. I mean, people like to 
be engaged in the goals as well. You know, so some pulling out some of those, yeah. And I will say, Lori Asklin used to do a, a great job with her outreach. She did almost a newsletter uh -huh. that said, "Here's what we're doing, and here's what I'm highlighting, and here's where we really need your help." And that was kind of a regular, almost a newsletter that she put yeah. out as a council person that served that purpose, I think, quite well, and was completely consistent in terms of asking for input on anything that was mm -hmm. generating discussion. Mm -hmm. um, well, if if we have said, and maybe we haven't said, that all existing transient lodging places will be grandfathered in, that I don't really know that it makes a difference to the existing. And I, I do rent out a room, so I have to disclose that. But if we might consider not grandfathering, you know, you know closing down some, then, then it would make sense to let them know. But otherwise, I don't know why mm -mm. people who are currently doing it would have any more. So I will say that, I, I mean, all the people on that list that I know personally talk to me about these issues. And, and are tracking this. So I think they do care. They have an opinion. They're in that sector. Um, again, I'm not saying they're the only ones, but I, I think they, they have things that they could share. But, 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 you know, but I agree. I like it. I, like something that we can do more. Um, the YS News helps us always, which I appreciate. But you know, as we all know, like looking at that agenda and the 200-page packet doesn't necessarily lend itself sometimes to identifying some of those So when issues. we're doing agenda planning at the council meetings, maybe we identify mm -hmm. those specific topics. Yep. That's a great idea. Um, because then we're publicly stating it at this meeting that the next meeting will have this, this, and this. Um, but then we have to be cognizant of adding things at the last minute. Sure. So. Which, which we've been pretty good about not doing. Right. So, so and, and Marianne, I don't think that we could not grandfather. I think that that may cause a legal issue. Yeah. So. Yeah. Megan? I mean, that's really the question. Can you say more about that? I, I would have to do research, but in general, that's why grandfathering exists. It's because if someone has already invested money into an accessory dwelling unit or a business or something and you're grandfathering them in, uh, because you can't now say, well, you've invested this money, but we're not going to let you do that. We approved it, but we, so reversing it and taking it away could cause you a legal issue. Well, I guess, though, why would New York City say you can't have Airbnbs then? Clearly, there are, we're already Airbnbs. And, and there are some legal uh, challenges mm -hmm. going on to that. And so. if I'm not mistaken, and I read a lot quickly, but if I'm not mistaken, the New York, uh, ordinance, if you will, does not apply to single-family homes. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so just to apartment buildings, because that's easier to abuse. And, right. Mm -hmm. and it was, yeah. I mean, I've, uh, I've stayed in there, an Airbnb that was in an apartment where a realtor owned the building, and all, every apartment was an Airbnb <laughs> mm. you know, in the entire building. Mm. Um, are there questions or comments from Community members? Okay, anything else from council? All right, so we will bring this back, it sounds like on the 22nd, um, and we'll also start this new initiative of uh, flagging key issues that the community will want to talk about. Um, okay, so next up, Patty, you're gonna talk to us about the cell tower lease buyout. Right, and um, this is, we are only talking here about the cell tower at Sutton Farm, okay, so we're not talking about the one on this property. Um, we currently have a lease with um, SBA Properties. As you can see, they pay us <laughs> just over $1,500 a month on that lease. Um, we are regularly approached by companies wanting to buy out our leases, uh, make them perpetual leases for a lump sum. We have in the past, uh, for instance, we've already been approached for someone to buy the one here on the Verizon Tower. Well, that's, that's too new of a lease to, to even want to consider that. Um, but the one at Sutton Farm is a little bit different. It's been there for a very long time. Uh, it has lost a lot of the uh, subscribers. So 
not only do we get it paid a certain set amount for the lease itself, but we get paid a percentage of the subscribers on the tower. Um, there's only one subscriber left on that tower now because we were just notified the other day that um, I think it was T-Mobile was pulling off. So I think Cricket is the only one left. No, T-Mobile is the only one left. So Cricket pulled off. Um, <coughs> so given the fact that that tower is just going to sit there and if they ever leave, they have to dismantle it, take it down, get it out of the way, give up the perpetual lease. Staff is recommending that we go ahead and take the one-time lump sum buyout for the perpetual lease. And that buyout would be a sum of $280,000. If you do the math, it would take us just over 15 years to get that money, um, taking it on a, a yearly basis. And if T-Mobile leaves that tower and SBA could easily decide with the new 5G coming to dismantle that tower, and we have nothing. Um, so this is a one-time payout. They would in turn get a perpetual lease. We would have that lease surveyed. Um, and then if they ever do decide to take the tower down, they have to dismantle everything and return it to its natural state. Um, so staff is recommending we take that buyout. Um, and if we do decide to take the buyout, we would ask that half the money be set aside to clean that spoils pile up out at Sutton Farm because it's pretty bad and to get rid of some of the chemicals that are out there and dispose of them. Which are property. not associated with the tower. Which right? are that's not associated. That's co issue. No, the spoils out there are from various construction projects that have happened over time and they've, they've been allowed to dump their spoils out at the farm instead of disposing of them properly. So in addition to the physical tower itself, do uh, is SPA granted some easement or access? They, to they will have access, access the same way they get back there now okay. through through the gate at is the Is there an exhibit? It didn't come in the hard packet. Um, there isn't. A, there isn't an exhibit be, other than the the um, sample buyout lease because we haven't surveyed the property yet because they didn't want to put the money into surveying the property until we notify them that we are interested in a buyout. Well, do you know how much? How big the property is? Um, the yeah. tower itself is about the same size as the tower no. here, and it would be just that square of that it's sitting that it's on. Actually, sitting on. Yes. Yeah. Not no, it's just the it's it's concreted in and fenced in, and be that area that it is sitting on, and access to that piece. Um, I noticed in the sample uh, agreement that there was reference to if the village or the county wanted to put something on that tower that they could mm -hmm. and wouldn't be charged. Mm -hmm. I, is there anything that we would ever put on that tower? Um, I mean, the only thing that we use uh, for villages, you know, the the police and emergency services radios and um, our um, public works crew have radios. Other than that, there probably isn't anything um, unless for some reason we decide that we want to put some kind of a repeater up there to mm -hmm. for 5G or whatever. Do we have zoning in place that would uh, avoid, because part of the uh, agreement also talks about how they can rebuild. So do we have zoning in place that would restrict them, you know, doubling the size or something like that? <laughs> Um, they would be limited by um, aviation laws, by the Okay, the so there are laws in place that would yeah. control that. Yeah. Or is there anything they could put there that we wouldn't want them to put on it? Because they have a lot of rights. Mm, I can't think of anything that, I mean, these are just communications properties companies. So I can't really think of anything. I mean, um, I can explore that possibility a little bit more if you would like, but off the top of my head, I can't think of anything that they would want to do that. And they can, can they actually do a perpetual? I mean, basically, it means they own it, except they don't have to pay the taxes. It, it so means that it means that they they ha they can have their tower on there and have access to it right. in perpetuity. Right. Yes. And then I notice there's something that says maybe there, maybe it might not be legal for it to be in perpetuity. Tw number 24, rule against perpetuities. 
number 24. I, th I, th I, I, guess. I think that's just boilerplate language. Yeah. So like if, you know, if there was a law or whatever, you know, that it would. I know that came up with the uh, uh, leasehold for home ink. That's why it's a 99 mm -hmm. year renewable lease mm -hmm. because you can't do it in perpetuity for some reason or at least advise against it. But I guess that's their problem. Right. And then one small thing. I don't know if Green County is also the name of the county for Florida or whatever, but if that was added to the R Green County, it needs an E at the end. Um, okay. So uh, other questions, comments, thoughts about this? I, I like the, I, I appreciated the creative thinking of the staff is in a way this is kind of found money at least as a lump sum that will probably gain a higher rate of return through investment than it would just having it trickle in year after year mm -hmm. and the idea mm -hmm. of using it to to do some restoration of the you know that of the farm there I think that's a good idea mm -hmm. I would support that any other thoughts? Uh, Megan. Uh, first, I'm just curious if there's other communities do that, that to, to put something into the yeah, It's, it's it, over the course of time, it's probably half and half. Mm -hmm. Some communities are doing it, especially with the advent of 5G, yeah. um, because that's going to be more of a spread out proposition. Mm -hmm. But it's still going to have to, at some point, kick off of these larger towers. Yeah, that was my second thing because yeah. I'm trying to understand this whole 5G thing. Yeah. And that's what Johnny kind of was explaining to me, that the smaller towers are going to be around, but they still need the larger towers. So I'm not sure right. the, that it will be obsolete. Yeah, the, it, well, the issue is that this company has another tower very close mm -hmm. by. So they, don't, they won't really need this tower uh, as much. Um, and they, why do they want to buy it? I think they just want to hold on to it in case because who knows what's going to happen with the next phase of communications. I mean, um, they actually have another tower on the east side of the village that would probably do just as well to, to relay all of their 5G signals. And I think that's where they're moving all of their subscribers off of this one. Well, it's worth $280,000 to them, so mm -hmm. they must have some plan. Mm -hmm. Well, they're certainly not going to share it with us, Mary Ann. <laughs> um, Bob? Brian, uh, does council still have time tonight for some citizen concerns? Or uh, well, we, to come, or? we did pass that part of the meeting, but... Um, we're here for an hour and a half, I guess. Yeah, yeah we good. actually were on time for once. But uh, I am... What is the topic that you want to speak to? Oh, the headline in... Uh, Um, well, <laughs> uh, you were late, I guess. I mean, we already, we, we talked yeah. about that. Yeah, it was on our agenda. Yeah. 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 No, but <laughs> um, let, we need to finish this piece of business and then I'll ask council uh, about adding that. Um, okay. We do have, we will have a second reading. Don't we have a second reading? We do have a second reading oh, on the rezoning. So, so the Bob, that it's going to come up at the next council meeting. So that would be a good time for you to have your comments when we're actually talking about it. Because we. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, Bob, just so you know, that's the first piece of legislation. Um, okay, so other thoughts about this uh, buyout? Yeah, it sounds like a good idea. I mean, I, I did do the math, and yeah, like you said, 15 years, it would take us to get that, and I mean, if, certainly if we can invest part of it, that's a win-win, okay. and I, I think it's, it's all good. I mean, yeah, certainly they're going to they're gonna do something good to where, and they don't have to share with us what they're doing, so it's in their best interest right. uh, to buy it out. You know, but for our uh, sakes, and you know, we're not giving up very much, um, you know, space-wise or land-wise, as long as it doesn't cause us any harm. Um, 
and and all the insurances are in place. So mm -hmm. Two million dollars worth of liability. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I, I, the one thing that I would like clarification on, and even though I did read the entire agreement, I didn't read it for Marianne's question, which is whether it's already in there that they can't like just change it to some totally different use. Okay. I would guess it probably is already in there somewhere that mm -hmm. it's you know it's got to be a similar I, use. Yeah, I. I but that would be um, that's the only thing that just in this discussion that raised a flag for me. Okay. Um, but I I think I also agree. This sounds like a good idea, and also when we think about the time value of money, that is part of the calculation that could probably mean that it would take even longer mm -hmm. to recoup that. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Um, okay, I will check into that. So if, if in fact, uh, there is no problem with the perpetuity and th they cannot change it to a dissimilar use, right. then I am assuming that council would <coughs> like me to bring the proper legislation to the next meeting. Yep. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Um, and so then we had one more new business item, which was the nomination of uh, planning commission members. And I also have ESC and, and ESC. Okay. ACC. Great. Okay. So uh, where should we start? Okay. Um, oh. So uh, Lisa and I met with uh, potential applicants for planning commission. We have an opening for a regular planning commission seat and then uh, for an alternate. Mm -hmm. And so we are recommending to, for a nomination Andrew Williams, A.J. Williams, who has been an alternate on planning commission and has a background, educational background and some experience in planning um, for the permanent seat. And we're recommending Dino Palata um, as the alternate. And Dino, as people know, I think, probably operates a business in Yellow Springs, has been on the Economic Sustainability Commission and we felt would bring um, some of that business and economic development expertise to Planning Commission. Excellent. So, so um, I would like to nominate, do we do that? together or separately? I think it's fine to do them together. Okay. Yeah. So I'd like to nominate uh, Andrew Williams for the per, uh, regular planning commission seat <coughs> and Dino as alternate. Second. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay. Lisa? Okay. So I have uh, for Economic <laughs> Sustainability Commission, um, I'd like to nominate um, Henry Myers, who has been on the commission for three years and is interested in extending his service um, an additional three. So I make that motion for Economic Sustainability Commission. I second. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Um, I'll also comment for people listening, if you're interested in being part of the Economic Sustainability Commission, we still have um, two seats available and one alternate. So um, we'd love to have you join us. It's going to be an exciting year for that commission. Um, additionally, for Arts and Culture Commission, um, I'd like to nominate Ara Beal to join uh, Art and Culture Commission. Many of you probably know Ara as a very well established person in arts and culture. We're delighted to have her. Um, interest, so I move that Ara Beal be accepted as a member of the Arts and Culture Commission. A second. All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Um, aye. And um, we also have open seats on, on arts and culture and uh, are more and more focused on the way arts and culture can promote activism and support the village goals. So it's not just about like liking paintings and stuff like that. We're really trying to have it be a very uh, serious and action-oriented commission. Thanks. Awesome. Um, okay, so that reminded me, by the way, 
Uh, what is the game plan for the Justice System Commission? When are we going to start recruiting? I'll let you. Okay. Yeah, so um, Lisa and I kind of want to go through and really see what the um, see what skills we want people to bring to the table for that. Um, and really vet the people that are on the commission. Um, okay. Really goal-oriented folks, so. Good, okay, good. So as long as that's, uh, you guys are thinking about that, great. Um, all right, so I believe we are now at our manager's report. It was very quiet over yeah, the so holidays. Yeah, it was short and sweet. Yeah, um, the only thing I do want to mention, I probably should have mentioned this at the, at the top of the hour, but um, the Utility Roundup Program is now accepting applications. So um, if you want more information on that, you can call the utilities office at 767-7202, extension 2, or stop by, and the ladies will explain the program to you. Can we post that on the website and Facebook? We sure can. Thank yes, the, the success of the program depends on the generosity of the community. It does. So please, if you have even one to 99 cents, to round up, please become part of this program. Great. And was that it for you? That's it. Okay. Uh, I don't think we have a solicitor's report. Judy? Uh, I don't have anything other than that I completely missed the boat and should have had in your packet at least a, a sample or a draft agenda for your retreat because mm -hmm. our next meeting is after that retreat. Mm -hmm. So if folks can get any burning retreat suggestions to me, then I will coordinate with the agenda planning folks to, to put that agenda together. And I apologize for not having that in the packet. Well, let's, so let's talk about that briefly. So we know we're gonna be talking about goals. Um, are there some other uh, agenda items that you guys are thinking about for the retreat? Uh, well, I do wanna say uh, in the context of goals, Patty, we want to have that discussion about what that means for our village team in terms of, so um, if, if it's possible for you guys to talk in advance based on the, the draft goals and start to um, tee that piece up yes. so that we can think about what we have capacity for. Yes. Uh, um, anything else? I, I wanted to say something about the we won't be there yet. Yeah, actually, well, why don't we put commissions on there because we could like have this a little bit more discussion about the budget thing mm -hmm. and then we could come to the 22nd meeting with a plan mm -hmm. that we can put out there. Um, okay. Okay, that sounds good. Anything I'm, else? I'm just looking at the, my minutes from last year's retreat at the beginning of the year. Uh huh. And um, some of these things might be worth revisiting. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about um, kind of council responsibilities, our role to support staff, and the balance between the goals that we set and um, the impact that has on staff. We talked about um, effectiveness of commissions. How can they be more effective? Um, you know, what's the role of that kind of back and forth where commissions make recommendations, but council also gives direction? Mm -hmm. um, um, and goals. That was what the last one. I also, since I seem to be guilty of sending out emails that are inappropriately addressed to more than one person, I, I would like to have that be a topic of discussion, uh, especially in regard to commissions, to really clarify. Um, because sometimes I want information to get out ahead of time so people have time to think about it, but, you know, why put 20 pages in a council packet or something? So c both clarification as well as ways of working so that it falls into being effective, I guess. How to be effective in light of sunshine law. Okay. Yep. Um, other thoughts? And I, I do also feel like part of that, um, I don't know that we need to talk about commission effectiveness this time, because I think we've drilled down on that, but I do think um, 
how the commissions are going to play, like being more intentional about how the commissions are going to be resources for our goals yeah. would be a nice thing to tie to this goal discussion. Um, so as we think about how, what role staff plays, we think about what role commission plays and, and so forth. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we have a ton to talk about with the goals. I mean, in particular, drilling down on that new goal that I've proposed um, about avoiding a deficit budget is going to be a huge topic for us to discuss, I think. Um, okay, so I think that's going to be plenty. And, uh, and then so, remember, everybody, bring your own coffee. Okay, so I have a quick question. <laughs> I will make coffee. Yeah. Bring your own coffee. Um, yeah, that's, that's uh, actually, I still it. have your coffee that you bought for council oh. in my freezer in my office. Oh, yeah, since we're doing it here. So okay. we can make that coffee, but bring your own food and snacks. <laughs> um, but, right. at, but we're going to have lunch. At some oh, yeah. previous yeah. council oh. retreats, not all of them, but some of them, we have had various staff members there for various pieces of the discussion. Oh, yeah. So is there... Are there any staff members other than myself and Judy that you would like to have there for any particular part of this discussion? Would it be too much to ask Colleen to come? Um, I will. I will speak with her. Because I think. Uh, I mean, I'm assuming you her, only want her for the budget. Right. Though. I mean, her her being there, or you know, we could like make that early on, or or, or whatever fits for her. Um, because I imagine um, we could probably spend an hour talking about budget stuff and just kind of like, just implications of that. Well, okay. if we're so, going to talk about the comp, comp plan, then we might want Denise there for that. Or, wait, wait, are we talking about the comp? comp? Well, it's uh, listed, adopt, updated, comprehensive. It's, it's see, keep, it, keep in mind goal. this is a Saturday right. that we're doing this. Yes, it's not well, a regular work day no, now. No, I'm just saying, yeah. I'm looking at what we're talking that, about. I think that's a planning commission conversation as to how that flows. Yeah. But, and yeah. we can provide that plug in for council goals. Yeah. 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 Um, so um, what about Johnny for the I, budget? How about I can work? talk about it at planning and commission I, because we have a planning commission meeting before our uh, yeah. before our retreat. Yeah. 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 Ju Judy and I can maybe talk about staff, which, you know. Okay. Colleen, Johnny. Uh, um, yeah, I think if, if Johnny was going to be around, um, certainly drilling down on infrastructure uh, in the context of goals would be great. Um, but I think in both cases, um, I don't want them to feel that they have to come on a Saturday. Okay. But if they are able to, um, and maybe they could you know, leave early on another day or something, that'd be great. Okay. Um, okay, anything else? Uh, all right, so otherwise, in terms of future agenda items uh, for the 22nd, so we know that we are continuing the transient guest lodging discussion, uh, we are continuing the goals discussion, uh, but we will probably have most of that resolved after our retreat, mm -hmm. and um, I know there was one more thing that we um, uh, popped up. One of the ordinance Yes. Ordinance to amend the mayor's court fee and, schedule. Yep, and the buyout. Commission reports yep. that we haven't had yet. And um, yeah, we'll the, you'll have a planning and zoning report. And all three of the reports from staff will be just in writing. Okay, so my end of year, public works end of year, and then we need to add planning and zoning because no, they, no. they're doing a separate one as well. well. When you say commission reports, Mary Ann, you mean our report outs? Or do you mean Not annual? annual report? Okay. Like the Environmental Commission hasn't made a. Nobody has yet. So is anybody? Yeah. Are you guys ready? Housing made one at the end of the year. Oh uh, well, I guess I thought of that differently. I didn't. To, uh, you didn't call it an annual report. Yeah, it was called an annual. Well, I I've think seen it was. Village manager committees don't make annual reports generally. They just yeah. report out when they're ready to report out. But I can schedule. We've got ESC ACC on the schedule. And I'll mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think send uh, that word to everybody. I'd rather. Hmm. Okay, if we can fit one in on the twenty second, if anybody's ready. No, we would. EC wouldn't be ready, but on the fourth. Oh yeah. Go on to do. Okay, for environmental commission. Yes. On the fourth. Okay. 
On the fourth, I'd also like to request um, some time for Dr. Sharon Sherlock from Reach Out to come and address council. It's a special report on how Karen Miller. The, re mm, it's at the Reach Out program in Yellow Springs and as a kickoff to exploring some possible collaborations. Who knows? Lots of potential. Yeah. So I'd, I'd like to include culture of health in the description of that. An update on that. Yep. Actually, that could be an interesting idea. Maybe we should have Cindy come as well. Yeah, that would be great. Could, okay. I'll, yeah, I'll ask Cindy. Uh, okay, anything else? Uh, what, just the other stuff that you've got listed. I think that's it. Um, oh, citizen committee nominations. Yes. Yep, I'm that's ready. on okay. here. Yeah. Um, yep. And uh, okay, I think I probably will be plenty. Um, well, I think on February fourth, you wanted to have the citizen uh, process. Oh yeah, there's there's a couple things on that timeline, Judy. I guess that we should get. Oh you know, lined up with the future yeah. agenda items. Yeah, you know what, let me plug those in yep. tomorrow before we have agenda planning. Okay. Um, and then I will just say before we wrap up the meeting, uh, Judy and Patty, we will, uh, Kevin and I will be scheduling our meetings for your reviews, um, possibly this week, uh, now that we've had our council discussion uh, in executive session. So, uh, so just so you know, like we're, we're almost there. I'm off okay. Friday. So, huh? I'm off Friday. Okay. Cool. Uh, all right. Well, we'll, cool. we'll figure out our schedules and then reach out to you guys. Uh, all right. With that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn early. Early? Yeah. We uh, saved almost a half hour. I move that we adjourn at just exactly the correct time. Okay. <laughs> I second. All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. You mean you had us going till 10?